You are listening to Cemetery Confessions, the world's number one goth talk podcast. Hello and welcome back to Cemetery Confessions. A quick note before we get into today's episode. Unfortunately, this is going to be the only show that goes up for this month. Uh, We had a show scheduled to record at the end of June, and unfortunately, the guest had some issues that prevented them from coming on for the interview, and they weren't able to reschedule or anything like that. If you don't know, it does take me about one to two weeks for each episode to prepare, to do research, to write up show notes, that kind of thing, and then about a week or so after the show's recorded to do the editing. And that's why we only, I can only do uh, two episodes a month max. So when we have a cancellation like this, so close to a deadline, there's really nothing that I can do to kind of put another show together. That said, though, there is a silver lining to this, Because now is the best time there has been in a long time to check out the Belfry Network. Uh, If you don't know, the Belfry Network is a podcast network that I put together, uh, which includes Cemetery Confessions. But we have a number of other shows on the network, and we just added two new ones. So let me tell you about those real quick. We've got, first of all, a new show called... It's Midnight Somewhere. This features Mistress McCutcheon, who you may remember from the Cat vs. Bat podcast, uh, which was also on the Belfry Network, um, with a new guest, another uh, DJ who is an ex-New Yorker that lives in Toronto. And they are doing interviews, talking about music, talking about the scene. Uh, As of my recording, their most recent uh, episode features an interview with Kevin Matthews from Boutique Records in London. So you may want to check that out. And then the other podcast we recently added is called Born in the Bat Cave. Uh, this is a shorter form podcast that is a conversation basically between two friends who grew up in the 80s in London and they discuss albums that they loved from that era. It starts in 84. They tell personal stories about their lives and kind of paint a picture of what it was like to be goth in the UK in the 80s. So it's a really unique uh, and interesting show. You can catch that on the Belfry Network, along with, of course, another, I think, seven uh, podcasts that are posting at this point. So if you want to check that out on whatever app you're listening to this on, just search for the Belfry Network. Or if you want to listen on the website, you can go to thebelfry.rip. So again, I'm sorry that there's only one episode of Cemetery Confessions this month, but there is a bunch of really cool, interesting content out there on our network that I would encourage you to all go check out. So with that said, this episode, Lady India returns to us from last month. If you don't remember, Lady India is owner and burlesque dancer at Phantasmagoria uh, under her business Antibiotics Production LLC. And on this episode, we're going to be doing another Reddit Q&A. So we're going to um, talk about a whole range of topics. I will share an embarrassing story about my childhood. Uh, we're going to discuss the place that we think goth should have in the world We're going to nerd out about Vampire the Masquerade, talk about gatekeeping as a deterrent, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So without further ado, Lady India, um, remind us where people can find you before we get into this. I have a a connection, Alex Black, uh, and he just started a new clothing business called Eat the Rich, um, the Chicago logo has an eat the rich uh e-t-c-h on it like or, excuse me eat the rich on it like that and um that is supposed to go to the covid relief funds in chicago the other designs we're still kind of trying to figure out like progressively 
what kind of charity those proceeds can go to um, after the business takes off. So it's kind of cool. He's looking for um, influencers in the goth community, specifically, like, it doesn't matter, women or men, like, just pose wearing his shirt. Or neither, yeah. Yeah, or or neither, doesn't matter. Like, who, a human being in the goth community <laughs> who has some pull, as long as you have an Instagram, like, have at it, and, um, and he'll send you a shirt so that you can um, promote to your audience. And the second thing that's on the roster is Ayatoya. Ayatoya oh. is, a, yeah. Do you know Ayatoya? I do, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, she's not, awesome. not personally, but I, I know who they are. Right, yeah. She's actually talked to the, let me see if I can get this right, because she sent me a, um, a message. So she had, she gave me a little update recently. She's spoken with the chairman of American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And right now she's having her songs be illustrated by a number of artists in the Chicago community. Now they're mm. going up for auction and those proceeds are also going to go to suicide prevention and mental distress from COVID-19 outbreak and consequences oh, wow. from there within. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And I'm one of the artists actually, like I'm oh, actually painting amazing. for one of nice. her songs. So awesome. I'm, I'm really stoked about that and I'm hoping you know, to just kind of spread that around a little bit. They're supposed to have like an out of the darkness walk, you know, for folks who are, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. rarely come out of the darkness. <laughs> and um, That's supposed to happen in September, all things pending, of course. Um, but we're, we're stoked about that too. All right, well, let's get into this shit show. Uh, <laughs> so we've got... Um, <laughs> I front loaded this. I've got it. Well, not front loaded, really, but I've got a couple more snappy, easy questions to kind of lube ourselves up before we get into the more in depth stuff. Uh, You got to warm it up uh, before you see where it goes. Yeah. Do some stretches, put a finger in there, you know, get it it ready. (laughs) The first question we have here is headlined. I need some tips to be goth in a sunny and hot country like Mexico. And then all they have to say about that is, seriously, the sun tries to kill me every time I'm out of my house. (laughs) I actually do have a really good answer for that. Believe it or not. Good, because I don't. (laughs) You're like, son? No. (laughs) You're like, I am like freaking pale. (laughs) Yeah, stay in the air conditioning. That's how I've lived my life. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I understand what it's like to try and survive summer festivals because I like people think of like, Oh, I want a spooky performer or several Mm. let's invite these girls. Oh yeah. We don't have shade for you. This is an outside performance. And we're like, Oh, how do we live? So, um, so some real game changers are to dress with ventilation. Like in other words, get kind of slutty looking. I'm not going to lie. That's just what it is. Um, huge sunglasses are a must. Um, being me, I like a sun parasol, which is an old Taiwanese trick and cotton gloves to keep, you know, the eyes and hands kind of looking fresh because those are the first things to go for women or really anybody who, Mm -hmm. you know, cares about squinting and, you know, being blinded by the light, um, for the women, uh, or women, uh, uh, identifying people, um, the, I killed my husband look with a sheer over robe to keep the sun (laughs) up. (laughs) <laughs> off of your skin is pretty great uh we use that on a boat a few times in michigan we being my performing girls at phantasmagoria mm-hmm. and so i personally i flip out about tan lines i know other people like in the goth community totally would because they look they, they just look really awkward and yeah. um i have to wear a little a lot of different stage costuming so i try to avoid them at all costs so if you can wear like a breathable I killed my husband (laughs) billowing (laughs) robe. You're probably going to be fine. And that goes for anybody. (laughs) Yeah. Weird, weird side note about tan lines. I, when, uh, when I went to the dispensary and I had to stand outside in line, I was really glad I brought an umbrella Mm -hmm. because, uh, I had, everybody has to wear a mask. So my first thought was if I didn't have this umbrella, I would have a real fucking weird tan line. (laughs) Uh, across my entire face yeah uh, yeah we don't really so. think about that but that is a thing <laughs> it is totally a thing 
and I can I can also uh, one of the things I was going to mention as well was the kind of um, a lot of places now you can find big wide brimmed witchy hats that yes. are real fashionable or even just the kind of black western cowboy kind of hat um, yeah. that's you know with big black sunglasses that's like classic eighties you know goth mm -hmm. kind of look and, mm -hmm. and that it covers yep. your face you don't have to put makeup on you know you can look as as much of a goblin as you want to <laughs> um, true. so that's always a good look and then my my only other advice was like for me uh if it's hot outside and i'm gonna be outside i'll just pick my most sort of uh moth-eaten death rock clothes with a lot yeah. of holes in them and stuff mm -hmm. um and they're nice and thin by the time <laughs> Yeah, you know, and those are breathable. nice, but there's also yeah. something really handy about nice, big, oversized, billowy things too. Um, mm -hmm. I find a lot of good luck with yeah. that. Nice natural fabrics, cotton, things like that, but loose and let the air flow through it will both help protect from the sun a little bit more than um, either the the slutty look, as previously <laughs> mentioned, or the the moth eaten look, because those, unless you're careful can lead to oh, right? really very interesting tan lines, lines yeah. but tan lines. Yeah. yeah you don't want to you don't want to do this the slitted jean ventilation thing like that's just that's good that's asking for it a little bit it's like wow now i'm a zebra um <laughs> but uh, i mean and then there's always of course the spf like thousand trick and um barring yeah. all that I would just suggest not drinking alcohol in the daytime because that's going to make you really really warm it's going to be a deal breaker for me, but for anyone else, <laughs> <You know. laughs> um, what, do you have any suggestions for makeup? Does just like a setting spray work for that or, you know, yeah. Um, I hate to say this, but yeah, like it's, it's, it's rough because when you wear makeup, you're going to need shade. So you're going to need that umbrella wherever okay. you freaking go and you will need okay. the best primer. You will need sort of like waterproof bed and eye makeup like that won't run like you're gonna need to shellac that shit <laughs> okay. um so some... do they make products for that sorry there's also the there's also the there's yeah, the old-fashioned there uh, hairspray trick yeah. too where you just basically shellac yourself yeah, with some hairspray of us do after that the yeah makeup. we absolutely do that and um i know that there there actually is a shellac trick um and we get it like we literally use sfx makeup uh, where there is an alcohol based, you can get it in Wolf's um, brand, uh, which is okay. kind of like the it's good it, because when no matter how much you sweat, the only thing that will make it run is if you drink, if you drink booze, okay, and like and you sweat, and you know that's the only thing that'll make it run. If you sweat like a horse during the day, it's still not going to come off unless you really want it to, and you're going to have to use alcohol to get it off. Huh. Okay. So Interesting. yeah, yeah, because I know if I'm if I'm going somewhere where I'm going to be sweaty, I just don't even bother with because I only buy uh, drugstore makeup basically, so I don't even bother with it if I'm going somewhere to sweat. Yeah, well, I mean, S well, that's fair, but SFX makeup in that sense is really good because that shit don't quit. Like, yeah, you can use a paintbrush, but the thing is, like, you're gonna need to dilute it with alcohol in order to even get it on in the first place. Well, see, so. but then you're just tempting yourself to drink it. So <laughs> what are you doing to me here? If I can smell it. Isopropyl alcohol. I want to, you know. Oh, now that's a need. <laughs> all right, all right. I mean, if you get off on nail polish remover, then, you know, enjoy it. But you shouldn't be enjoying the smell of some of that stuff. We're talking serious alcohol, not... <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So let's go to the hop to the next one. Uh, which band was your gateway? Get a little uh, kind of background information here. So they say I was 15 or 16 and was enraptured after hearing this corrosion by the Sisters of Mercy. So do you guys remember the first time the first goth band or goth song that you heard and how that made you feel inside? <laughs> Oh my god, I'm like embarrassed to admit it now because there's been so much controversy. I don't know, man. <laughs> well, I think I think if I remember last time you said it was Manson. It was because like that was like a sexual awakening for me too at the same time because it was like only like a 10-year-old girl. We didn't have cable. Like we didn't I was at a friend's house. I was like, "Oh shit, like 
Like, who's this, like, long-haired, decaying, made-up man in a corset weeping blood? Like, why am I disgusted in love and suddenly obsessed? <laughs> <laughs> like, it was, like, my only knowledge or exposure to what goth culture was at that time, and it opened me up to, like, mainstream bands on MTV that I have branched out from since, but I suppose grade school teachers were, like, a bit more disturbed by my drawings since then. So I was mm-hmm. basically the mm-hmm. Tina Belcher of my class. <laughs> <laughs> Singing about butts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Butts and zombies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was what about that, you, Trey? Yeah. Well, for me, I mean, I, I'm similar in that I guess the true gateway or the thing that opened my eyes to alternative music in general, not not goth specifically, were not really goth bands, but sort of traditional gateway bands from the nineties. Uh, were basically Nine Inch Nails and Typo oh, Negative. Nine Inch Nails, yeah. um, hearing them on the radio because yeah. they got radio play, it was like, oh, what's this? This is different than everything sure. I've ever heard before. And then having you know the friend that I worked at the library with, well, um, Moxie, Aww, as I Moxie. mentioned last time, who you know when I mentioned I was liking those bands, she was like, oh, here's a whole list. And that's where I started getting Aww, into really? you know, Bauhaus and Sisters and and Susie. So it was probably the first official goth bands I listened to that grabbed me on that list. Probably Sisters and Susie, but Dead Can Dance also really knocked me out too. Speaking of radio play, I don't know if I'll keep this in, but I, I remember uh, since Manson and the radio came up, I remember having sex in my car <laughs> to heart-shaped glasses playing on the radio once in a park. Well, that's what uh, you're supposed to do to that Yeah, time. so that was, that was the thing. <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? Like, we're all, like, kind of, like, holding, like, the bridges of our noses and going, like, why? Why did you have to do this, dude? (laughs) Come on. You ruined it. Drugs are a hell of a drug. Um, Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So my... Um, Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. I was just thinking about, like, all the other 90s bands. Oh, oh, 90s bands, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that have now gotten, like, expose for, well, being a 90s band. There's whole but yeah go, go, do go yeah, on. There's whole the memes counts. about it for I mean this is not goth but pop punk. There's whole memes about pop mm-hmm. punk bands just being child predators basically. So it, I mean there's a, you know yeah they're kind of gross. Yeah. <laughs> um so my so as you all as many people know I grew up in a very conservative family and community and this is going to come up come up later in a, a question about psychology of getting into goth. Uh, but I had very limited access for a very long time. Um, so my first uh, experience with a goth song was in the year 2000. Uh, essentially, I was subscribed to a uh, Christian heavy metal magazine uh, back when they used to make those things, uh, like print magazine that would get mailed to you. And um, oh, yeah, it was, I think it was called HM yeah. Magazine, which was just heavy metal magazine. But forever ago, yeah, a long time <laughs> yeah, ago. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so you know, full on <laughs> interviews and stuff. But for a while, they were sending uh, compilation CDs with the magazine, which was an amazing deal for me because I was just a kid. I, I don't, I was like fourteen, maybe. I don't remember exactly. Um, so I would get the comp and, and listen to it. So I remember with this specific one, uh, I had gone to a park, um, to, cause I don't know, I was a kid and I, but I remember being on a swing set as you yeah, do listening to this <laughs> in, uh, in the day in the sun, sunlight. And somewhere in there was a song by the awakening, which was called dark romantics. And as soon as I heard that song, it's like a classic. If you don't know who The Awakening is, it's like a kind of goth rock, gothic rock kind of band. And the we are the dark. Exactly, romantics, it's the, the most cliche, romantics. cheesy yeah. kind is of. Is it? Is um, it? Is, it's one of those like um, memes of a, a girl in a dark, billowing dress in the cemetery at midnight, and she has a rose. <laughs> basically that was basically the feeling i got the story behind that song is a little sadder um he the song uh ashton wrote that song for a friend of his who had died uh who used to use that phrase dark romantics That's beautiful. but it was base. it's basically it was basically that and i remember that came on and that was the first time i had been really into metal because that was the alternative scene that i had access to because at, at that time there were a lot of christian metal bands and that's all i could listen to mm-hmm. 
Um, and as soon as I listened to that song, I, I don't know if I can describe the feeling I had, but I remember the moment of thinking this is the kind of thing that I have been trying to find that I didn't know I was trying to find. And I remember listening to that song on repeat like 20 times that day. I went and I told my best friend like, oh, I found it. This is this is what goth is. I found I found that thing that pe- I've heard people say that was goth. And like, this is it. This is what... And I was just so hyped on this song. And then that led me into, I didn't get into Susie or Bauhaus because I didn't have access to that. So I, there were other Christian, Christian goth bands like um, Save Your Machine and Leper and um, Dead Artist Syndrome. Um, who else? There was one that uh, the birthday uh, or the wedding party. There were a few of them. So that was approved by my parents. So that's what I got to listen to. But I remember that moment and the way that it made me feel. Uh, and that was like, after I heard that, it was all over from there. So I think that's a really powerful psychological explanation for getting into something is the limitations that you have. And see and and yet like yeah. you're still able to like grow and branch out from them anyway i mean that's powerful yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. oh yeah it was and it i i, I mm-hmm. you know I, I said i couldn't really describe it but it, it was so strange to me that this sound that i had never heard before but i knew was there was something out there and then as soon as i heard it i thought this is the thing that i've been wishing existed and it was just so strange that it just kind of materialized in that moment. So it was it was a really powerful kind of I think that's why I can picture in my brain like the park that I was at, my surroundings and everything. Um so yeah. I, uh right. So I was just gonna say uh, I next, freaking love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's great. Yeah. It was it was a great moment for me. Um almost as good as the first time I put something up my butt, <laughs> but we'll get to that later, maybe. Hello. Uh, so, <laughs> Uh, cool. So the next one is titled, uh, where, oh no, when do you draw the line in gatekeeping? And they say, hello. The reason I asked this is because I saw that video where a guy hangs out with goths and the guy asks one of the goths on their input on gatekeeping. And she said the only gatekeeping she was okay with was with music, which I agree. Goth is a music based subculture. However, sometimes it's a problem. So let me explain. Story time, my little batties. Uh, so I used to be a part of a goth amino, and the amino was very gatekeepy. I uh, have never me, heard the, <laughs> the term amino as a group before. That's cute. Oh, yeah. Amino is an app. It's, it's like a different social media platform. Oh, my God. Please cut that out. I feel old as hell. Okay, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I only know about it because it's been mentioned in past episodes. I was never, I, I'd never used it, never heard of it, but it has been mentioned Okay. Before. I feel old as hell when I just went to, I found a podcast <laughs> today called Goth Topic. And um, it's fine, but I, I did, I listened to a little bit of it, but I went to their website. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, cool. Maybe I can go like them on Facebook and learn a little bit more about who runs the podcast. What is it about? Uh, but their website only had a link to Instagram. And I had that moment of, God, you fucking kids. All you care about is Instagram. <laughs> and you just have photos and there's no information. And I don't give a... <laughs> uh, but yeah. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. The moment I joined Twitter, I just like realized. I was like, oh, my God. Even older people are part of Twitter. And I just joined. <laughs> <laughs> I think Twitter, at this point, Twitter is an old person It kind game. of is an old person game now. I think it kind is. Kind of now. Yeah. yeah. I mean... Given that the, uh, given it's it's our primary method of getting government news and information, <laughs> very yeah. much an old person Jesus thing. Yeah, fucking... Trey, you have a you have a really hot point there. <laughs> Take a deep breath. On that one. Yeah, right. Uh... Smooth out your smooth out your forehead. <laughs> no, Take I, a deep I breath. I actually had my sort of feel old slash nostalgia moment just the other day. I was just randomly looking up stuff and I was looking up goth MIDI files to see if I can find any oh. of those classic things. And I found a great Beer. vintage Angel Fire web page with <gasps> repeating bat font Beautiful. and flashing or repeating bat background and flashing fonts and Oh nearly illegible God. page. <laughs> it's it's a wonderfully beautiful thing. That. That's the black metal of fresh out of the nineties. It's great. 
So um, this person says, uh, but as I stayed on the Amino, I noticed that people were starting to bash other people brutally just for having the title goth in their videos. But the thing that made me leave the Amino was the creator. This adult commented on a post about goth music. She talked about this teenager who was new to the subculture and was her sister-in-law, apparently. Um, when you're new to the subculture, you believe almost everything a goth on the internet says. So she thought you didn't have to listen to the music to be goth. So then this adult called this teenager stupid just because she didn't think that she had to listen to the music to be goth and, uh, yeah, a bunch of people that she doesn't know on the internet. So, uh, that's why I kindly recommend bands to people who are new to the subculture because I feel like some people don't know the difference between gatekeeping and bullying. I think that's a fair last point. Um, yep. I do have I do have a story about please, that. Please, please tell. Um, a little little prologue to the story is uh, gatekeeping to the extent of bullying is going to make a subculture die. So you you can't afford to be like yeah. that. If you want to help keep your subculture alive, you got to educate mm -hmm. your babies. So not only do you become respected in your community for that, you become someone who can lend a word of wisdom to those who seek it. Yeah. Uh, my answer sort of blurs into a music question onto, or onto this list of fielded questions, I think, but um, I'm adding a new and fresh perspective here. So, um, so I, I personally believe it is also dress and personal outward expression to some extent as well as psychology. So uh, story time. Mm. <laughs> Uh, one of my best friends, uh, Mike Skull, who's uh, who is Sarah's former bassist of Bellwether oh. Syndicate and Forty Five Grave, um, he had a great photo taken of him standing next to a young lady in a Misfits shirt, and she was giggling because he had her holding up a sign that read, "I have never listened to the Misfits," <laughs> <laughs> and it totally took the internet by storm. Like they sent him so much hate mail. They called him a gatekeeper, a misogynist, a bully. But what they didn't see was that he asked her to come to the store the next day where he gave her a stack of CDs he thought she would like in order to introduce her to punk, punk subculture. Mm. That And she ended up absolutely loving it. She loved the music. She felt like really validated in her choices and, you know, where she was going with her, um, with, with who she was. And they became fast friends and he became a resource for her to look up to. And his, his moral was, if you gatekeep instead of educating, you watch your subculture die. And I absolutely subscribe yeah. to that. And, you know, watching that like really like motivated me to like think about that a lot more when, when it comes to people who are being, um, I don't know, like elitist, yeah. I guess, you know. That was a good story time. I also have a story time, but Trey, go ahead. <laughs> well, I don't have a story time because I'm not much of a storyteller, but yeah. as far as the whole gatekeeping concept and idea, um, my main issue is a lot of it comes down to, at least with the quote unquote elitists and the gatekeepers, they're unwilling to accept people non-fully formed. They expect mm. everybody to be you know, fully knowledgeable about everything if they even claim a tangential interest in it it's like you know oh i'm into goth well do you know all of these bands and do you know the bassist in this thing and do you know the oh first God, singer of this other band and it's like that's that's a great way and to be exclusionary birthday. and if that's your point i mean that is kind of <laughs> gatekeeping i guess in a nutshell and mm -hmm. to reiterate what lady india said if that's all the people in a subculture do it's going to die yeah. because all you're doing is saying anybody new or at least anybody who doesn't know everything already which is basically anybody new, yeah. um, is not welcome. Yeah. And we're not going to give any help. We're not going to help bring you in. You're not going to teach you or any of that. It's just, you're just not welcome. We only want the people who already know everything. And yeah, your subculture dies. So, I mean, I think the important thing in gatekeeping is, or healthy gatekeeping, I guess, is viewing it mm -hmm. as a teachable moment, a learning experience. When somebody new comes in and they have questions or if they have misconceptions, even if they're shouting those misconceptions with all the authority that, that uh, a young person always seems yeah. to have, you have to <laughs> take them and find them where they are. Yeah. And you know, confronting them directly and saying, no, you're stupid, isn't going to change anybody's mind, isn't going to do anything. It's just going to turn them away, but they'll still be holding on to whatever misinformation um, they had. Yeah. So... You know, it, it's an opportunity for discussion. It's an opportunity for dialogue. It's an opportunity for education. 
And it's a matter of finding them where they are and saying, oh, okay, so this is what you think. Well, what about this? Have you looked into these things? Have you checked out these bands? Have you checked out the style? Whatever aspects you feel is limited, introduce them to it. You know, as, as the, uh, the uh, gentleman from Lady India's story, you know, be that resource. Don't be judgy. Don't be telling them that they're bad or evil for not doing the right thing and corrupting the scene. Give them the information and, you know, they'll do with it what they'll do with it. And the only time that gatekeeping, in my mind, becomes somewhat valid is when all of those attempts are present and the person that's holding the wrong opinions yeah, is if somebody's obstinate not about going to be receptive, not it's... accepting the information. Yeah. yeah. I totally agree. I mean, if somebody's not going to be receptive, like we don't like you don't want an asshole in your subculture anyway, like right? Yeah. Like you want people to be receptive and you want there to be like a give and take. And I mean, of course there's going to be assholes in every subculture whether or not mm -hmm. you like it, but I mean, if we can gatekeep a little bit for that, that's fine. Yeah. So it's really just a two-way street. We have to be willing to educate, but you know, the people who are coming in do need to be able to listen to some degree. Do they have to agree with everything? No, there's a lot of diversity within the right. subculture. There's disagreements even within elder goths. But that being said, there's this, there's a sense of respect <laughs> and a sense of community nonetheless. And that's what needs to be maintained. And I think that's the important side of it. Yeah. We're so few anyway. We can't function all by ourselves. Yeah. Come on. I only I laughed when you said you're bad at storytelling because I also am terrible at storytelling and every single thing I've ever listened to or read about how to make a good podcast says you need to be able to tell good stories. And I cannot <laughs> for the life of me tell good stories. So I just thought that was funny. <coughs> um <coughs> sorry. Got some whiskey up my nose there. Um, <laughs> well, that's not how you're supposed to drink it. Yeah, I know, right? That's not <laughs> comfortable at all. Um, so I, I think I'll power for you to try new things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think both of you kind of brought up a couple different ways of seeing gatekeeping, and I think that's part of the problem with these discussions is that some different people have different ideas of what gatekeeping is. Like some people define it as any kind of restriction. So if you say, you know, you have to listen to goth music to be goth some people would say that's gatekeeping um or the kind of uh, trey what you brought up the hyper specificity thing there's that classic joke that goes somewhere along the lines of you know someone at, going up to a random person at a club and, and saying you know how many pubes did Roz williams have when he released path of sorrows and if you don't know you're not a real goth kind of thing <laughs> I mean, none uh, shaped, but that's yeah, okay. Exactly. That's Answer me these questions question. three. Like, <laughs> really, you guys? Like, can we like just? And um, like... but and then the other way I've seen it used is people uh, in discussions online is people saying just anyone who's kind of a stuck up or aloof or better, you know, gother than thou kind of dick bag. Um, I've seen people mm -hmm. use gatekeeping in that way, uh, but I think. I th the I think the advice I was going to give was similar to you, Trey, just kind of ask ask questions. The story time I was going to use to to illustrate that was I saw a uh, a post on a goth Facebook group recently uh, by uh, it was a white guy, and that'll I'll explain why I, why I think that's relevant in a second. But he wrote this mm -hmm. this whole diatribe <laughs> about um, what goth is. So he started by saying. Is, you know, I've been part of the goth scene for 14 years. And then uh, his post basically boiled down to uh, saying goth is a mindset. So then his, you know, he was, so his post was, he was making a bunch of statements. So for, well, first of all, I, I have a problem with the 14 years thing, because it feels to me when people say that kind of thing, and the way this was written, it sounds like it was written by someone new. And when someone just says, oh, I've been part of the scene for 14 years, it's like, what does that mean? And why do you feel the need to say it? Because in my mind, for 14 in years. my mind, it's like, oh, I watched Tim Burton movies for 14 years. And then I started dressing black a few years ago, dressing in black a few years ago, uh, rather than what it's supposed to mean, which is I've been an active part of some in-person community for 14 years. I think when people lead with their time in the scene it tends to be like to kind of 
pretend they're something they're not. But basically, he made a bunch of statements of fact, like goth is a mindset. Um, he said uh, uh, goth did come out of Victorian philosophy. And then he was he basically said goth music is is uh, only a byproduct of that Victorian philosophy, which makes it non-essential. So he's basically telling you in absolute terms what goth is, which is annoying because it's not a conversation. That's just somebody telling you, I'm right, you're wrong, na 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 na. Um, so, and that kind of gets to the reason why I... Th- this suddenly makes sense <laughs> about the white <laughs> I was mm-hmm. raised as a white man, and I was basically taught by everyone I knew that everything that I think is relevant, everything, every insight that I thought I had was some kind of um, access to special information that was relevant to everyone else and should be listened to, and everything I had to say was gold. And that was reinforced by, like, everybody I knew. And because I was a Christian... That's interesting. Because I was a Christian... Like, even in context. Yeah. Sorry yeah. to No, that's, that's fine. Um, in, in the Christian context, that's that was... Exciting. People would be like, oh, you're... You're, they treated me like I was a budding prophet and I had some kind of special revelations or, you know, with my family, it was just like, you know. What is that even like? I'm a female so, person. What is that like? Yeah. So <laughs> I grew amazing. up thinking that everything that I had to say was important and everyone needed to stop what they're doing and listen to what I was saying. And that's a thing, even though I've wow. gone completely the opposite direction, that ego kind of still comes up and it's something I have to recognize and contend with. So when I see that people speaking in that way online, I kind of spot it really easily because I I kind of see that's the same mm. thing that's happening. Um, and yeah, but it's, yeah, I'm sorry, that's just fascinating. It's like, wild. What? As soon as I realized, like that, just to hear it from the yeah, inside. Every and it, even if it wasn't overt, even if it wasn't as overt as all the random people that would come up to me and and tell me that. I was like some kind of, you know, I was going to grow into a prophet and and preach to thousands of people. Even if it wasn't as extreme as that, it was just other people's behavior because they would kind of, um, and I think it's this thing that that women especially are um, trained to do, kind of expected to do, to stop what they're doing and kind of nod and smile and agree with whatever uh, a man is saying. And just to reinforce their ego, even if they are already know more about the subject or even if they already knew what was being said. And so people treated me like what I was telling them was they were in rapture of, you know, and, and that's for an impressionable young kid, that's hard to realize that that's happening. And so it's pretty mm-hmm. fucked up. But yeah, ba- my advice was basically just what Trey said, you know, kind of use the Socratic method, ask people questions. If uh, really kind of just avoid people like that guy, <laughs> if you can. Uh, but otherwise, if it's an, an encounter in a club, you know, ask questions about what they're saying. So I don't know. Anyway, sorry, I got off topic. I think. There. I think. No, I think that was awesome, and it's perfectly relevant. Um, I think because... I think a lot of that is is holdovers from the old tradition, you know, from imperialism yeah. and from um, what is it, evangelical or evangelism being a a. Mm-hmm. A Christian going to "quote unquote" uncivilized yeah, nations. The the, the idea of the, the white man's burden. Yeah, mm-hmm. is that the Western European is the most evolved yep. and societally developed part of the world, and so our duty as good Christian Europeans is to go to Asia and Africa and the Americas and teach the savages how to properly exist in this world because we know best. Yeah. And that's something that 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 tradition, that standard still holds over. And there's still this idea of, you know, this hierarchy of societies that, you know, naturally most societies or most people in a given society tend to feel they're the top of it, of of all of societies. And so it's their their burden to teach the savages the right way yeah i mean and not to mention like uh you know even if goth does have its roots in um victorian uh 
Caucasian culture, like it doesn't mean that it hasn't evolved to be on those borders. Yeah. I mean, Chinese have their vampires. Mm-hmm. I mean, and those vampires are totally scary oh, too. Fuck, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. They're like, they're like zombie vampires. Yeah. And then we have like the Haitian zombies and like, you know, like there's, there's tons of awesome goth discoveries worldwide. And like there shouldn't have, it shouldn't have to be sequestered to one corner of the world and yeah. continue to be. Yeah. Yeah, all, all societies have some sort of a what could be considered gothic leaning mythologies or or aspects of their culture and the goth subculture itself has taken influence from all of these things around the world even more so as we become more and more globalized and new people come in bringing their own traditions in and I think that's what makes it rich and interesting because all societies have traditions around death and mourning and the supernatural and the strange. Um, and it's great to see that from all these different societies. And, you know, what is it to, you know, what is the, the weird, strange and, and death like from an Aboriginal culture? And, you know, how can discovering that as a European based person really broaden my horizons and, and pique my interests? So the, the next uh, question we have here is what place does goth What place does being goth have in the world? Which we sort of answered, but we could go further on. (laughs) Always go further. Um, Always. (laughs) And the only thing they have to say is, what place does being goth have in the world when it's expensive buying a ton of, albeit cute, accessories for my goth image, and when the demands of adulthood determine that it's not good to dress as such in our jobs? Oh. I have such vehemence with this right now because I <laughs> I will unabashedly say that I have butted heads with my practice management teacher on this like fully. I am um, like really determined to name myself something like the revolutionary needle when I like graduate from my grad from my grad school. Like I'm going to be an acupuncturist, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be seeing patients and I still want to maintain my subculture like and wear it on my sleeve and the reason why i feel like it's so important that it's perfectly embraced um is but well it is perfectly embraced by every gender and orientation a person can be of any age when so many other subcultures haven't come forward in that respect and i feel like done right the subculture is a safe space which does not promote false positivity and it nurtures a sense of self-acceptance so it's not just letting other misfit people know that they aren't alone in the way they think and receive the world around them. It's opened up a new place for kids who don't fit into the mold to start their own expression. And that's where you can see like the little sub branches of goth evolve because, you know, they're starting to find themselves here and there. So if anything, dressing goth had a lot of people in my clinic opening up to me who had never thought that they would to anyone else because they thought, you know, hell of all people, she won't judge me. So I don't care talking about, you know, my sex life or, you know, what I might be doing on the weekends. Um, So as a working professional interning in her senior year in the medical field, it's taught my superiors to not judge a book by its cover. It's taught my professors, you know, and I'm going to toot my own horn here, that intelligence does not have to come in stereotypical Mm. brown nose or nerd Mm. format. (laughs) Yeah. It's taught my patients that their healing comes in different bodies, and Mm. I have not once been questioned in clinic about my crazy hair. In fact, I have a sneaking suspicion that some of my patients are excited to see what I'll be wearing next week, (laughs) other than the white coat. And this includes a 92-year-old woman from Texas. So I have to ask people to not touch – the only only drawback is I have to ask people to not touch me sometimes, but – that in itself is a learning experience for those involved mm. and a good one too, if executed positively. Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful way to look at it. That's, that's lovely. <laughs> I love that. I mean, I just feel like, you know, if you, if you promote some differences in the way, you know, you are, well, not just you are, but like, you know, you can see very blankly on the outside that someone's different and then that, that it's okay. It doesn't affect anything about them and who they are that's how we change the world i mean it really it sounds cheesy Mm. as fuck but it really is like oh yeah you see the humanity in other people like that's how we change laws and policies and treat each other better hell yeah 
Yeah, I think it's I think it's absolutely central. So I mean, being goth and and having that play as a place in the world, like if you identify with that, be true to yourself. You have one life. Mm. Yeah, I was good. a lot of a lot of my you know discussion on the same topic were along very very similar lines. Uh, I think one thing that that the goth subculture is very good at doing is showing others in the world that people can exist and be successful and be productive members of society and not be you know a danger yet still not toe the line of quote unquote normalcy not you know tamp down individuality to fit some sort of generic mold of the societal mean um so as as we're out there you know, looking strange and different and maybe getting abuse for it or getting weird looks or that, that uncomfortable course, feeling as you, as you enter a, a, an environment and everyone like their, their heads follow you as you walk through because you're something novel and interesting. But then through acts, through what you do in the space, what you do in the world, you're showing that you can be uh, a safe person. You can be a person who can help other people, can be a benefit to society. And I think as an example, it's great for the world to see that, to see that you don't need to be this sort of generic mean to, to fit into society. Society can embrace a multitude and is more powerful in that. And I think us existing in the world can help that along with many other people in this world who are, are different from the norm. But uh, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently, um, especially given the social climate with the, with the protests and, you know, mm -hmm. black and white lives and all that stuff. Um, totally. I just finished reading the, too, the white fragility yeah. <laughs> book, which was, oh, you know, yeah. on the top of all lists. And one thing it got me thinking of was this concept that was addressed that there's a luxury that white people, especially white, white males, tend to have when it comes to being able to express individuality. Yeah. Because white male is such a blank slate, it's kind of, it's the quote unquote norm. So people mm -hmm. don't necessarily notice, you know, the society as a whole doesn't notice your white maleness. So where you diverge, where you show your individuality, that's noted. And so mm -hmm. we are given more freedom to express our individuality because we're not, that individuality isn't being drowned out by being a black person or Asian or Native American because people in, from other cultures or other ethnicities, other, you know, even genders or gender expressions that are outside of the norm that identity, whether it's their true identity, whether it's their individuality or not, that group identity tends to drown out individuality. So it's harder to speak with that individualistic voice because of the, the volume of what your perceived culture is projecting, whereas being a generic, just an everyday Midwestern white American um, when I'm weird, it has more impact because that's such a jarring difference from that blank slate of uh, white cultural identity. Yeah, uh, that's a profoundly true statement. And it's interesting that when you mention it so broadly like that, you, you see um, like uh, trans, trans folk like or queer folk. Um, you actually see, and and at, at least this is my observation personally, uh, people of color are far more comfortable, you know, being able to speak with a, a so-called misfit um, than they are somebody who's uh, conforming to what all of, I don't know, what all of quote unquote before was. Mm -hmm. um, and I had noticed that even you know, whenever I, I put in different locks or changed my appearance, you know, I would, the people of, co people of color, like any people of color, like would just be far more comfortable speaking with me than when I, I actually went blonde for a period just for fun. Mm -hmm. And, and, and nobody, nobody liked to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> it was just really interesting. I was like, huh, 
all right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's that was very profound, Trey. It is. Uh, that reminds me of um, a while ago, I read a film critics sort of breakdown of The Matrix. And one of the things that stuck out to me, this was before uh, Lana Wachowski came out and said that The Matrix was basically like a story of her experience as a closeted trans person trying to pretend to be masculine for everyone else. But one of the one of the things that stuck out to me was this person said that um, the reason Neo was so successful was because he was a blank slate that the uh, the viewers could see themselves as because he didn't emote and he didn't have too much of a personality. So you could place yourself onto him. And it's just I thought like, it was just it was Keanu Reeves. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean it could be. That's interesting. But it, that's why well the chosen. Is well chosen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it, it is. Yeah. It's. I mean, it speaks to this uh, this assumption that the white male is the standard, that that is the normal. You know, that is the the that's starting point, and that's why representation in film and and media is so important because once you start to humanize, and that's part of what you were saying, Trey, with about goth, and part of where I was going to go about, um, you know, normalizing and legitimizing alternative ways of being in the world, that once you start representing other ways of being as people also existing and having human experiences, then you move away in popular culture from just the white man being the the top of the tier, right? It's we're all it goes more towards we're all in this together. <clears throat> when you start adding representation and telling those stories as well. And it's sad because that actually reflects on The Last of Us 2 just came out and there was a huge backlash because uh, one of the characters in the late game is trans and they tell the, the story of uh, this trans person's experience and there was a whole backlash of, of people saying, you know, these SJWs trying to shove their narratives down our throat and whatever. But it was literally just a story in the broader story of a mm -hmm. trans person existing and people yep. were mad because there was a trans person existing in this world. And so that's why that oh. is so, so important to normalize that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's so sad when a tiny little minuscule diversion or, you know, difference from so the norm is such a cause yeah. for outrage. It's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. That's, oh, that's tragic. Um, and then for goth, I mean, I think, I think goth has a history of, you know, obviously, and we've explained this to death, but briefly, like goth has shared spaces with alternative subcultures in its history, queer spaces, BDSM spaces, other marginalized subcultures. Um, it was the first place that I have ever seen men wear makeup. Exactly. Like, I yep. loved it. The gender bending. The sexiest thing in the world. There's, there's that <laughs> feminist ideology and kind of expression of breaking those gender norms that is implicit in goth. Um, it's part of why, you know, Trey, you were the first on this podcast to say that, but basically um, that existing as a goth is itself a social and political statement. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and I think now, especially there isn't a way to um, be goth in some sort of neutral or apolitical way. Um, and I think that's part of what bugs me about when I don't see other goth, like goth YouTubers or goth influence, I hate the word influencers, but like goths that people follow not saying anything like even just saying black lives matter because it's like i don't care if you're in europe well first of all that's a whole other thing because you can't pretend that european countries don't have a history of imperialism and racism on their own nope but, but they're protesting right. too so I exactly mean, the protests exist why aren't you joining it um mm -hmm. but just you know just saying those words black lives matter is letting the community that you're a part of and people that look up to you know where you stand and what they can expect from goth yes uh goth culture in general and you know and that's why it, it, it bothers me that there are goth influencers out there not saying these things because it is in my opinion a sort of tacit uh approval of their privilege when you get to ignore 
the decades of abuse and trauma that that white colonizers have put black people and people of color through. And if you aren't acknowledging that those systems still exist and continue that trauma today in in general culture, but also in goth, I think you're complicit in that system. And um, I th- I think that is one of the roles that that we can play as goths in broader culture because you know beyond beyond being like a creative community and a platform for people to have to kind of nurture uh their their passions and grow and learn about themselves in the world um it, it's important and that that in itself is actually important too because uh creating a space where people everybody can do that impacts the web that we live in uh, because white people tend to think of themselves as like the 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 protagonist of everyone's story, but we're not. We are. We yeah. all influence everyone else's story, and the way that you behave impacts everything, all the way up to like government governmental structures. But just even the community around you and the people around you, there is no way of getting out of saying that. Well, it starts with a microcosm, exactly. Really, mm-hmm. and 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 I and speaking of microcosms, and um, one of our in the last podcast that we all had, you know, that we all had together, um, our team specifically, um, we actually spoke about uh, a young person of color in Georgia who wanted to put on makeup and she felt like she wasn't doing mm-hmm. it right. And she said, maybe it's my skin color. I don't know. And I'm like, I think just giving some black love and like black girl magic love or like black whatever magic love like in you know goth subculture is a really you know it's i don't want to say like a like a novel or essential idea but like it's it shouldn't have to be novel because Mm. uh we for so long like it's been kind of you know what do you think of you think of white white face Mm -hmm. like a pale white face like you think of just like white pancake makeup etc well, that's at least what the general public thinks. I yeah. mean, we know better, obviously, mm-hmm. but we we want to expand that normative yep. outward. And if we're going to do that, the image has to <clears throat> be a little more inclusive as well. And I'm not saying that we have to, we don't have to include, you know, neon colors or anything. But I'm just I saying, am. like, if, <laughs> 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 but. But people of colors, however, (laughs) um, I feel like that should be more seen. Yeah. And and for whatever reason, it's not being as seen. Completely agree. And and I don't know why that is. But well, we can always seek to change it. Absolutely, (laughs) and I think that's because I think there's this idea that goth is just this kind of it's its own social structure that exists outside of other social structures which is insane because of course goth it includes and absorbs standards and norms from outside culture we're not some sort of uh island unto ourselves that is untouched by everything going on around us Mm -hmm. we live in the same communities that everyone else does and those ideas and ideologies I I talked. To, I don't know if it was a Facebook post, but I was talking to somebody about how neoliberalism was a is a big problem in in the goth community because it allows these ideas to seep in that seem to be progressive but are actually anti feminist and and anti queer and and hurt people, uh, and they get perpetuated in our spaces. And I don't think we can stand for that anymore. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, move on to what do we got next here? Uh, <laughs> right. Calm down for a second. Um, I all know. Right, explaining to others what I am. This person says labels to describe myself are something I'm not for, considering I like many things and don't feel the need to conform to one label wholeheartedly like one does with religion. When people ask me what am I or what I am, they're expecting a label for an answer. Most of the time, they'll automatically say, Oh, you're goth. I feel nice that they recognize <laughs> it, but something doesn't sit well with me, and it leads me to an identity crisis almost. Anyone have similar experiences or feel the same way? How do you counter it usually? Hmm. Well, I'm biracial, so I feel that all the time. Hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, people always come up to, or they used to 
now we've yelled everybody into having manners. But <laughs> before, before um, people would be, people would ask me, they'd say, what are you? I'd be like a human being, female, uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> single female college <laughs> student. No. Um, but yeah, they would, they would ask me, what, what are you? No, where are you from? Like, like, no, my mom's from Chicago or she's from Taiwan. Like, you know, dad's from Chicago. Um, but it's, but yeah, you get that feeling of not exactly belonging or belonging anywhere. So you could actually flip the script. Um, I am actually considered a jack of all trades, uh, polymath, because I've had to include a lot of things. I didn't want to, I didn't want a white collar or desk job for like the longest time. So I included as many creative things as I could before I had to finally buckle down and like get something real. Um, uh, so I just told people at that time that I, I'm an artist. I belong everywhere and nowhere at exactly mm. the same time. So they seem to an- like that answer just fine. You know, you could smile and say, I don't know. Or I would say I'm dark eclectic. It sounds like a joke and people don't linger on it. And I don't feel weird saying it because then I don't have to commit my identity to anything. Um, and that's And that's at least where I stand on it. Like just in my own, just speaking to my own experience. For me, I I don't, I don't really have a good answer to that question because I generally hold any sort of group identity that I might associate with very, very lightly. I don't, I don't integrate too much of my, or I don't put my entire self-worth in membership within any given larger community. I don't have this strong need to belong, yeah, to be a part of something bigger than my, myself. I'm generally fine just being me. So when it comes to my identity, truly my true answer is I'm Trey. That's really all there is. Um, when it comes to goth identity and my, my association with goth, I do feel that's a very important aspect of my life and something that I view as key, especially to my development through the years and how I established my concept of self, but it's not so integral that if I'm told by somebody that I'm not goth, I become offended or uh, ashamed or anything like that. It's like, no, whatever, that's that's your opinion, Um, but I'm still gonna continue participating and having opinions and, you know, being within the space. So, I mean, that's that's kind of how it breaks down for me is just it's not that core to my individuality that I am goth, though, if somebody really wants to dig in and starts exploring things like, well, what do you do? What kind of things do you like? Then I'll start talking about, well, you know, I'm into these bands and I like going to these kinds of clubs. And sometimes those conversations are awkward because usually it's people who either know nothing about it and like, what the hell is that? What are, they, what are you talking about? Or they have already a pre-existing uh, negative stereotype around it. Though part of me enjoys when, you know, I've had a relationship with someone, they know me as me, and then we start talking about my existence in goth spaces and my identity uh, associated with goth, and maybe opening their eyes that, oh, this person that I've gotten to know and learned to respect to some degree is also a goth. So maybe all of those things that the media, them being Satan worshipers and dangerous and murder cults and all those things stemming from are all know, completely satanic true. Panic. Yeah. Oh, no, no, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, being able to flip the script on people. Yeah. Cause one of the things I really love most is just, I like to upturn people's preconceptions whenever I can. I like to have people have one of, impression about something maybe a stereotype based impression and i like to upturn that as much as i can going back to you know the previous question of the place of being goth in the world breaking up those norms showing counterexamples to those norms i think is critical for society and that's kind of how i use my identity and how i interact with the world around me yeah it's speaking your truth that's and that's beautiful i like you know you're like i'm just me Mm -hmm. and this is what i identify with and and trey and i'm just uh are you (laughs) do you guys ever have you ever watched the it crowd yeah Yeah. i've seen every episode (laughs) 
<laughs> several times. Yeah. Uh-huh. What, what, what's the fellow in the back that Noel Felding plays? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, um, um, oh, fuck. Oh, I always forget his name, name too. <laughs> I forget the character's name, uh, but you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, he loves Cradle of Filth. Hang on, I'm going to Google it. Like, he just loves them. And, but he has no idea what he's become. Like, he doesn't know. He doesn't even know he's got. He's just him. He's just like, I don't know why nobody Richmond. wants to talk Richmond. with me upstairs. <laughs> Richmond! <laughs> there you go. Uh, he doesn't know why nobody wants to talk to him anymore. He's uh-huh, still being him. Uh-huh. He's still doing the thing. Until he's he just, until he learned but, to overcome that and goth started to his boss. Uh, goth yeah. to boss. Uh, goth to boss. Yes, he learned to overcome it. Goth tour. to boss, you guys. Man, I haven't watched that in years. I wonder. I bet that's on Netflix uh, or something. It's totally on Netflix. Just just putting it out there. Um, <laughs> so my thoughts. One of the throwaway lines in this uh, about religion. I just want to point out. I understand that this is an aspect of Abrahamic religion, but you don't have to wholeheartedly conform to one label with religion either. If you don't want to No, um, it's not an aspect of all religion, which is something that it seems obvious to me now, but having grown up in a conservative Christian house was mind blowing to me at some point, Um, which it kind of goes into my own personal experience about sort of, explaining to others what I am because I've gone through a number of, I guess you could call them existential crises, uh, trying to navigate and understand who I am. And, um, at this point it's kind of, that has kind of become just an aspect of my life that I have to deal with. And that's something that I've learned to, uh, I guess, the pain of that uh, of existential crises can be painful and i've kind of mitigated mm-hmm. that through like philosophy and um meditation and that kind of thing uh some of those experiences so so those i guess i should uh uh quantify that some of those are very short uh existential crises that are more like based around dysphoria and uh that kind of thing but some of them have been well, and and I guess related to anxiety and depression as well. Mm-hmm. But some of those experiences have been like year or more long journeys of self discovery and questioning the foundations of everything. Basically, my my thinking about myself, my thinking about the world, my thinking about thinking. Um. So that feeling of not really knowing for sure who I am is familiar. And I think that's kind of a good thing because you should never really hold any knowledge with 100% certainty, certainty, I don't think. And so I think you should try to embrace that, embrace the unknown, embrace that kind of process of... And self-exploration. Self-exploration, unraveling and rebuilding... Um, however, however that works for you, for me, you know, if it's, it might be philosophy, but for other people, it might be shadow work. It might be, uh, Buddhist teachings. It might be whatever that is a therapy. And I love that you mentioned this. Sorry to go ahead. No, 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 interject myself. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I'm just like, and please hang out of the thought. Cause I really do want to hear the rest of it. I just, I just, I'm so glad that you brought up the fact that this person says wholeheartedly like one does with religion. And you mentioned it in Mm. Abrahamic religion. Mm And I just like was brought back to like how like I was just like, how was I raised? And I was like, I wasn't raised specifically per se with religion because under one Asian household and I was raised, you know, Asian, like because my dad's always at work. And so who raises you? Your mom. Right. Mm -hmm. So like your your household in Taiwan will have four different religions under one roof sometimes Mm -hmm. and nobody cares. Like literally nobody cares. And then that one person, one person can be three things there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Three. Mm -hmm. And it and nobody cares. Like, and you could just be really happy about it, and it's totally fine. Well, I so, think that's I think that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. I think that's the way to go because, like, even the term Abrahamic religion, I didn't know that for most of my life because I was just taught. It kind of goes back to that imperialist thing. I was taught that Christianity was the one true way, and everyone else was either deluding themselves or hadn't been educated yet, so they were ignorant. Right. Whereas mm-hmm. if you're brought up in a house where 
you're taught to question things or you just have an example of people that have different varying beliefs. I think that's really important because that kind of opens your worldview to ask those important questions. So you don't have to have this kind of crisis of identity when you're in your <laughs> late twenties <laughs> and you're like, Oh my God, maybe <laughs> Christianity doesn't have the answers for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, but I, yeah, I didn't have any other. Sounds really limiting. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, I think you Chinese would be like, you have only one God. Where are you going to get all your stuff from? <laughs> <laughs> I think my breaking point was when I realized he was angry that I put things in my butthole, and then and then I was like, all right, see you later. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, that's not that's not true at all. We all but, have our uh, line. Yeah, <laughs> your hellhole. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I I think both of you basically said what I was going to say, which was just you know, um, you don't owe people a label. And I've heard people respond to that question with like, I'm just me, or I'm into a lot of different things. Or I, I've, I've heard in high school was the first time I heard somebody say, you know what, I really don't like labels. And I thought that was a stupid response. But then what that did was open a conversation to explain that. And mm -hmm. that was when I kind of realized that like, oh, yeah, society kind of expects you to fit into labels. So you're easily definable. But because people like categories, it makes them feel good. Yeah. They're like, oh, this person belongs over here yeah. now. They do. And it, it does kind of go both ways. Mm -hmm. This concept of a, you know, ready made package bought bundled identity to some degree as an individual. You know, this is this is what, you know, teenagers go through and all that with the whole quote unquote, neo tribe, right, whatever right. thing, yeah. this idea that you can look out there and see, oh, this group, I can join them and they define all of these different aspects of my life because I'm part of this group. I don't have to think mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the kind of music I want to listen to, the kind of books I want to read, the kind of clothes I want to wear, the kind of activities I want to enjoy. I can just pick this ready-made identity, yeah. pick this group to become part of, and then I just... I get all of this stuff and, and it gets dictated to me. And there's an ease in that. Yeah. There's something yep. that's very nice it's and comforting. Yep. Yeah. It's comforting to have yeah. that, that given to you. But at the same point, the downside to that is if you discover there's an aspect of that package bought identity that doesn't jibe with your core inner being, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. where you get that existential crisis is you're like, I really well, am comfortable it, in this world. It's based on people. Exactly. But like people are all individuals. Like mm -hmm. they're all complex little universes onto themselves. Like you can't box that. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you get those, in, you get those existential crises because it's like this. That's very, this uh, that's, doesn't that's fit. That's very uh, Buddhist of you. Uh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> I actually am. I'm more Taoist than Buddhist, but they're related. Um, but yes. My grandma the, was both. <laughs> what was that? My grandmother was both. Awesome. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that's, that's kind of, I, I like the idea of sort of an a la carte identity where I, I try to engage in, you know, break down all the aspects of who I am mm -hmm. and look, what do I like in this aspect? Okay, cool. What do I like in this aspect? Okay, cool. And I try to pick and choose from that. And does that lead me to being, you know, more akin or more close to certain groups than others? Sure, but does that mean I then have to go whole hog and say, okay, I'm closest to this one, so I better conform and get all of the get, get all of the features of this and, and integrate them into my personality? I don't I don't view that as important. So I think while an a la carte identity is work, I think it's also more flexible and leads to less internal strife when you find those conflicts that inevitably arise. Mm -hmm. um, when working you, on yourself is hard yeah <laughs> and whoever said something worth it wasn't was easy you know yep so. basically and you see, work on discovering who you are from birth to death and you're not done finding who you are until you're dead and yeah for me i go straight to like what does it even mean to have an identity and does that even make sense in the first place and when you start breaking down the boundaries of the those assumptions and now of that's what Dallas it means to be a person <laughs> <laughs> that really gets into like some deep thought, I think. But we're, I'm, I'll, yeah, let's not. Uh, ooh, let's we not can go that. on that yeah, all yeah. day. Yeah. yeah, we could. We really <clears throat> could. 
So, all right. So let's so let's move on. So the next one is titled, "Do you find it hard to socialize with others?" Uh, this person says, "This is something that I've been thinking about for a few weeks as I started re- reflecting on my past." In short, I've always found it hard to relate with others and make friends and just trying to develop strong socializing with others, especially when it comes to talks about music. For starters, I don't know that uh, I do know that most people are not into or even know goth music, and I've accepted that I may not meet very many people in real life who are into goth music, but I've come to find that even my taste in non-goth music is kind of not the norm. When I'm listening, oh, yeah. when I'm listening to goth music, <laughs> I mainly find uh, myself listening to a lot of '90s alternative rock and '80s new wave synth pop alternative. I think the problem for me is that my music taste is considered outdated more than anything. But I just find it hard to get into a lot of newer music outside of goth-related stuff. So it makes talking about music with people kind of difficult, since I like a lot of older stuff, whereas most people I come into contact with like modern stuff. But even then, I just find that generally trying to relate to people is a bit hard for me. Yeah, I'm naturally more introverted and don't do well in crowds, but still, I've seen other introverted people be able to socialize fairly well, and it just makes me wonder why it's harder for me. Um, I don't want to attribute this to being goth because I know that stereotype isn't true, and there are plenty of social goths that do integrate into society fairly well, even if they can't meet many people into the same things that they are into. I guess I'm just wondering if it's like this for any other goths out there. Uh, Do you find it hard to socialize IRL? Yep. Mm. (laughs) Nah. That's a pretty resounding yes. yes. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Okay, all right. Like like we have two different sets of answers here. Trey, that's good. Like do you would you like to uh expound? Would you, after you? Yes. I'd be more on, than on happy your... to. Um I mean, I I definitely feel this person's pain, especially in you know, new situations, new environments. How do you how do you how do you even start the conversation? How do you with human? People? Yes. Exactly. Um, I mean, it's it's one thing, and I'm very comfortable in certain environments where I, I've existed for a while. I know people. I know the environment. I can definitely open up and be more social in those environments, which is why people who've known me for a while, like either in, in a club space or even more so at work, are surprised when they find out that I am fairly painfully introverted. Because I've been in that environment for so long, I've learned the ins and outs of everything in that environment, and I have a sense of expertise Watch within how that they environment. Work. And when all that comes together, it's a lot easier for me to start a conversation because usually the, the new person is not comfortable in that environment. So I can start the conversation with, hey, this is what I know about this environment that we happen to be sharing. And it can build from there. So those cases are fine, but give me a new environment. Take me to a party with people I don't necessarily know. Take me to a new club or a new club night even. If I don't know the majority of people there, I go into observation mode. I totally shut down socializing. I have I, totally seen you do that before. Oh, yeah. No, I find a corner and I At sit karaoke. and I watch. <laughs> scary <Scary-o-key. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's but yeah sorry it's funny the, i think the first com well maybe one of the first conversations i ever had with you i don't remember if this was the first time i met you or not but it was at a house party a goth birthday party uh you know goldie uh but i remember one of the first conversations i had with you because i was um i was just i This was at a point, maybe six years ago, I was trying to reintegrate myself into some kind of community of other goths because before that I had had a kid, I'd got married, I had like a bunch of life things that kind of took me out of any kind of community. Mm -hmm. Um, And I had, before that, I had been in a very kind of um, walled off Christian goth community. And I was like, "I, I think I need to expand my myself and get out there so this was part of that excursion and so the first conversation i had with you was when in this random person's basement uh at somebody's house party and uh, we start i i started talking about having conversations or having a conversation about having conversations and how Mm -hmm. i was generally uncomfortable with the idea that you go somewhere you meet someone new and there is this unspoken 
Otis to continue a conversation, and I was very bad at that. And one of the first things that you said to me was, "Oh, I am too," and I've just learned to be comfortable in in silence. And I w- and and then shortly after that, we just kind of stood there in silence, and I was like, "Oh shit, I think I love this person." And uh, uh, Sarah told me a very similar thing at one point. I, I think after we went to one of the Renaissance fairs, she said, "I, you know, I really like Trey because I feel comfortable just kind of." standing around and not talking about anything and i'm not very good at talking about stuff and trey makes me feel comfortable just being around because there's no expectation that i'm supposed to say anything mm-hmm. and and so that's very you much you guys just made me understand introverted people thank you <laughs> <laughs> just by saying those things <laughs> so yeah that, I, I don't know if you had anything else to say but i wanted to cut in and mention that no i, I covered most of what i had to say i think I'm I come from the polar opposite background of Trey. Um I am an extreme extrovert, which is kind of unusual for this community, I understand. Um, well that's that but, is a, that is a trope within goth of the the introverted goth finding their extrovert and their designated extrovert being the person that introduces it, it them to other true. people. <laughs> <laughs> It is so no it's true though. It, I'm the um I'm the uh quintessential, you know, like the uh, like the uh art school hall girl mm. that introduces the mm-hmm. new girl and mm-hmm. says, "Well, these are the assholes and these are the whatever, Jack." You yep. know, like so um but yeah, no, I'm an extreme extrovert and I um I find that I love watching how people react to my weirdness because it lets me know who they are as people. Um, so while the introvert Mm. might sit back, like you guys were talking about, they might observe, I, I put out feelers and then I watch and then I, I, I respond to reactions. Um, I used to take bets with my sideshow family to see if one of us could make our audience members barf before the end of our show. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, if we could do it was a smashing success. Usually Jezebel was the winner. Mm. Um, (laughs) Uh, we've done a pretty a few pretty cool things like I've speared uh speared my best friends through the arms with um syringes and we've shot like fake blood out of her arms and it was fantastic. Wow, beautiful. Mm-hmm. Beware the beware the splash zone. <laughs> um <laughs> it says uh so if um so I'm one of a few people who guest perform with Jezebel Aries and Wilhelm Reaper at Bondage of Gogo, run by Mistress Alina. And by the way, the exit's opening up again. So oh, really? whether or not you'll you know yeah it it is they're only allowing 50 people in at a time we're still kind of taking like suggestions for how to like do this safely Mm -hmm. but we're we're gonna try and uh get the ball rolling again um and it's great fun seeing tourists drop in to see a touch of our madness so if i'm lucky i'll get a 20 dollar bill staple to my butt like well some one of them like kind of freaks out and yet has the time of their life all at the same time (laughs) so i really i like hamming i love hamming it up there like people just don't care it's it's gritty it's you know naughty um if uh but but in this case this person is super concerned about music and i always felt like if that's something you feel passionately about and you're an introvert that hates small talk because i find that like usually it's small talk that like people hate it's not talk in general um that that you can relate to something about how the music you listen to makes you feel instead of what the music actually is. So it doesn't matter if the person you're speaking with likes like Dolly Parton and you like Susie Sue or Susie and the Banshees and you don't know the difference. Yeah. It's okay that I love both. The thing is, if you yeah, I know, right? <laughs> They're so good. If you feel if you feel empowered by your music and they feel empowered by their music, you can relate you could relate to what you like to do while you're listening to your music, Mm. you know, like just how you and and connect on that level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, The most important thing with attempting to socialize and find common ground is to get in touch with who the person you are speaking with actually is. And sometimes I find literature and film more than music is a great way to connect with others who may not be in our subculture. Um, And it's important in that aspect to stay multidimensional. Like I've performed for and like now I have to back away from that quite a bit just because of politics at this point. But like I used to perform for like a, a redneck veteran audience, mm-hmm. like the bikers, like out in Pecata- uh, Pecatonica. And they would raise money for breast cancer, um, mm-hmm. breast cancer patients. And that's where I would have some of my shows. And I had to relate to them on their level. And it wasn't mine. Right. Um, 
you know, at all whatsoever. Right. And at the same, at the same point, I uh, also performed with, like, I don't know, like, why they were like, here, you, you seem like a good person to perform with us. But I felt really honored to be included. I was in um, Strawberry Taylor's all black cast for, <laughs> and I'm not black, but I was in an all black cast um, for uh, something called Verbal Intercourse, which was a, a very, like, sexually um, explorative and... Um, exciting show like where where we kind of like broke away from cultural normatives and and express sex in like poetry mm. and dance mm -hmm. and song and it was cool. it was actually really beautiful yeah. yeah it was very opening and i was like the only pale skinned person on the south side and some of these clubs going like well thanks for having me oh. i know it's strange i'm here <laughs> yeah. but hi <laughs> and you know you had to be okay with that both of those things so to find common ground even though it's not exactly who you are you can find common ground in how people feel because that's the one human thing that we all have in common is just basic emotion mm. and relatability to what makes you what sparks that joy i mean mm. sorry to get mm -hmm. to that point <laughs> say that on my own podcast that's, yeah no, I, Mary I think that's i think that's an absolutely <laughs> fabulous insight uh, just taking mm -hmm. things to a more abstract and not being bogged down in, you know, the specifics of what band or what books or what movies, but why. The, the whys mm. are the more universals than the what's. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Some people never think about those. So it's easy. You know, I, I've listened to, uh, I, I listened to a conversation and they literally went on for 30 minutes just talking about obscure goth bands. Just, you know, random connections of singers and bassists and guitarists and doing this tour and doing on that label and this random fact, uh, which was, I felt a little out of my depth. It was cool to listen to, but I think there's, you know, some people just never think about the conceptual aspect of that. And it's just all about, you know, memorizing <laughs> who's who, what little little known factoid about this band is and bringing that up in conversation so it just kind of depends who you're talking to um that might be which... true or it might be they just have never been asked to think about it and and yeah if it sure. comes up it, they may have opinions it's just it's never mm. it, it's all been backgrounded in their mind it's just these are these these sort of lizard brain responses to it and i don't mm. really think about that i'm thinking about all this trivia or about all these details whether it's it's about the trivia or whether they're big into music theory and they're de looking at what chords are those and how's that chord progression work and what does the instrumentational texture look like? Um, and sometimes that's very easy to con contemplate, whereas the the messy reactions that our, our bodies and minds and feelings and hearts and souls, how that how that responds, that exists, but if you're not asked to think about it yeah it may not come right to to the yeah. fore so why engaging in that conversation might be a great way to open it up people might be i've never thought about that but yeah i do feel this or that or this song makes me excited or i keep gravitating to this song and now i'm thinking about why yeah yeah or like you know like like hey have you ever heard a bass line that made you feel like you just wanted to like jerk hit off it and then... oh sorry Yes. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and like for you're like for me that's X Y and Z song and that they'll be like, "Oh my god, that's like so funny because for me that's X Y and Z song." It's all about grooves you in know? the heart. Yeah. Mm. Um so one I guess I only had a couple thoughts on this. One of the the, the the things I thought of kind of going back to the previous question about kind of thinking about yourself. Um, not to say that this person is, but a lot of people who have this experience are somewhere on the spectrum. And mm -hmm. I think because that's not talked about, a lot of people don't realize they're on the spectrum until they're in their twenties or thirties. Um, that's a really good point. And so, not of that. uh, you know, f doing some research and thinking about that might be helpful for this person specifically. For me, just as a, a general introvert, um, I... I have a really bad way of getting around this, which is generally like substance use. So either Adderall or alcohol or something like that, because I have this kind of filter in my brain where. Oh, that's John too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, John and I have connected on a spiritual level. Um, 
Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I, I have this like. He was too shy to go to your birthday party at first. Did you know that? I'm totally going to Oh, I could tell. No, I could tell. The... I mean, I knew. I was I, like, like, oh, you're me. I know. I, it's fine. It's okay. Yeah. I like literally gave him a bottle of wine or, or whatever. And I was just like, you're going to your friend's birthday party. And he's like, and you're taking my car. Take my car. You're going to your friend's birthday oh, party. Adorable. But mom. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i have i have this i have this filter in my brain where i'll want to have a conversation about something or bring up some topic but i'll just think i'll start thinking like uh you know my opinions aren't that important or what i have to say is boring or i'm gonna look dumb in front of people that i like or you know whatever it is and i just and so i end up not saying anything because i'm too afraid to say anything mm -hmm. um and so that's something that you you just kind of have to get around the other way besides substances the other way i've learned to get around that if i know i'm going to a social function is to think of it and this it sounds kind of dumb to me but it works is to think of it as more of an interview which is something i've uh developed after having done this podcast but basically you just kind of think of and memorize questions before you go out so it's, that's not stupid at all so sticking on was see because it seems like from the outside it seems like people have effortless conversations um and so i never thought to to kind of prepare before i go to a thing uh so when i had that moment of of realization it, it helped me and so maybe it'll help somebody else but so so for music you can say like um, oh, you know what? I don't know much about modern music. What kind of bands are you into? Or um, what, what's what been released recently that you've been listening to and why do you like it? Or what shows have you seen recently? I guess that doesn't really apply at this specific moment. But, you know, what uh, that question has gotten me a lot of traction. What shows have you been to recently and how was it? How was the turnout? How did the bands, how did you feel about the bands? You know, what was that experience like? Mm -hmm. Uh, just kind of prepare some of these interview questions beforehand, and then you can pop those out. And I think in my experience, I found that most people are pretty, uh, I guess, keen to talk about themselves. So oh, if yes. you can get somebody talking about people themselves. who dress up like to talk yeah. about themselves. Yeah. And I've said this before, people who dress up love to talk mm. about themselves so that's yeah, totally okay so you can, go in with questions and people will love yep. you for it you can walk away from a whole conversation where you said almost nothing and feel like you had a productive conversation mm -hmm. <laughs> and the other person also feels like you had yep. a productive conversation that's the great thing about it yeah <laughs> all right next all right so here we go what psychology brought you to goth so here's what this person wrote oh we're, we're... Ooh. Yeah, we're getting, we're doing it. Uh, I was always kind of different, but upon closer examination, I think there are some interesting reasons contributing to my involvement with goth, and I want to know if others are the same. Initially, I was keen to think, oh, maybe that's where I picked up that word from. Uh, initially, I was keen to think it was just that I naturally liked the music and aesthetic, perhaps due to growing up with Tim Burton films and anime influences that prompted spiked and dyed hair in a time where those things were more taboo. But the more I think about it, I also realize that there was a fear component. From a very young age, I had sleep paralysis nightmares and later dealt with a fear of horror movies. Uh, there was also a fear of never escaping the darkness of depression and a fear of death. So I think in a strange way, aligning myself with goth was a way to take ownership of the darkness and fear that I felt surrounding those things so I wasn't afraid of them. Of course, it would seem that many goths enjoy horror movies, so perhaps it's not a common thing, but I was curious if anyone else felt the same way, or if not, how would you describe your connection to goth and the macabre? What do you think attracts you to identifying with it? I think this person is spot on. Mm -hmm. Whoever wrote this. Mm. Yeah. I, uh... I mean, shit, like, I, I love the idea that they brought childhood psychology into it and then, like, kind of uh, deviated into adulthood. Mm. Um, I I think about, um, you know, when when you think about darkness, and I'm not talking about, you know, in, in the, I'm talking about it in the sense of the unknown. Mm -hmm. um, people have a fear. That's why they love categorizing and mm. they love, you know, and but the idea of involvement with it is um takes away the otherness of it um 
I, I remember, I know in my own experience, like my, I, I owned that, like when I was a really, really, really small child, like, I mean, the, okay, story time. I'm going to have to do it. You guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> While you're here, do it. I, it, yeah, I guess it is, isn't it? Um, yeah. See, even as an extreme extrovert, you can still doubt yourself like quite a bit. So <laughs> anyway, um, I had my mom fill up a, when I was like three or four years old, I had her fill up a, a, a water bottle, like a spray bottle, you know, like the kind mm-hmm. you use to spritz your, spritz your plants or your cats, mm-hmm. like depending. Mm-hmm. And, and I told her that she needed to chant over this bottle. Like I gave her directions. I said, these are to make a barrier around the bed to make the nightmare shrink so they can't get onto the other side. Mm. And so I made her do this incantation thing. And then I made her spray around the parameter of the beds. And I said, okay, good. And then I, and then like, as I got like, you know, I thought about it more and more, you know, even at this like little itty bitty child age. And I would say, oh, except for the cats, like the ones that are shaped like cats, they're okay. Like, Mm. oh, or except for the cute monsters, they're cool. (laughs) And then I'd be like, well, you know, the ghost little little kids, they're all right, too. And then I would, like, keep thinking of more things to, like, let mm-hmm. pass this line between me and this line. And until I was like, you know what, Mom, you don't have to do this anymore. Mm. And I just, like, I will never forget that as, like, a psychological experience that, like, kind of, like, brought me a little bit closer to that point. And instead of being afraid or of something unknown. I wanted to become involved with mm. it. And I, I got a black cat when I was four. This kitten was my whole world. And like, you know, it's like, I'm a witch now. It's official. Mm. Um, mm. And um, I, I did, this was before, you know, I even knew about any media with so-called goth, you know. Um, you know, and, and then you would, and then bringing this, bringing this whole idea into adulthood, these things that you identify with so young, become a source of comfort in your adulthood the more you develop with it and when you see media that resonates with you it resonates that much more profoundly Hmm. that's um that's similar to my experience my adult experience with witchcraft which is a it's it's a whole complicated topic because i am an atheist so it's a whole thing but uh, a lot of a lot of um <laughs> it sounds it's a whole topic yeah uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> information you find about witchcraft stems out of wicca which talks a lot about you know before you do any sort of ritual or spell to cast a, a circle a uh, circle of protection or however you want to phrase that and uh mm-hmm. eventually i evolved into thinking of of that being unnecessary and i know there's a faction of uh practicing witches out there who also do not cast circles because of similar reasons that you mentioned that it's a, you know, we are part of the everything around us and um, trying to avoid those things and to not we have to interact those with those. Yeah. Is, is yeah. Uh, problematic in its own way. You're kind of cutting yourself off from, from yourself and from experiences outside yourself. So I don't, uh, whenever I do anything, I don't cast uh, any kind of circle of protection anymore because I don't want to get into it too much, but yeah, it's, that's what it reminded me of. I hear that. Yeah. Um, so sorry. So yes, psychology of goths. Did you have, uh, anything else you wanted to say on that? Um, I, I also think that it's, uh, the one other thing that I, I wanted to just lastly touch upon, which I think has been, we've touched upon it before, um, is that it does actually, the psychology behind it, it does give something, I mean, outside of just being, you know, um, macabre or whatever, it it allows people to have an avenue to exist in who feel like they don't really belong. Like there's a m- miscellaneous factor. And then, you know, maybe that, those thoughts of not belonging bring them to a darker sense of self Mm -hmm. in the sense of just, you know, they have like a negative sense of self, Mm -hmm. but then they find something that like actually embraces them and Mm. it embraces everything without a false positivity. And that's, 
incredibly invaluable to somebody who's struggling within a, a closed community. Like, you know, I can't even imagine. I, I don't want, I never want to be a teenager again. Like yeah, that's, Jesus fucking I mean, Christ, and thankfully I never shit. will be. Yeah. But I, Ugh. but I mean, my God, if I had to do it over, over again, I absolutely would not. Yeah, no. I mean, hell what no. hell was that? Hell no. So, um, and, and in that case, I, I still speak to this day about, you know, thinking about that in particular. Um, people would ask me when I was a kid, you know, in high school, like, you know, 16, 17, they'd be like, well, what? Like, what do you really do? And I said, like, it's a state of mind is what I would say. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, they, I mean, what do you want? Hensdale Central. Like, you think they're going to listen? So. <laughs> so this is a, this is a harder question to answer, really. It is really. so hard. I have um, so much problem, so many problems with this. So I'm not 100% sure, you know, what that sort of original germ, that original psychological basis because I can remember from being very young, I did gravitate to the, the outsider, I guess. Things that were a little bit weird, a little bit different. Um, and, you know, I always liked the, the darker, richer colors, too. So the palette always drew me to some degree. But then just things that were weird, whether it was, you know, watching things like the Adams Family and, mm -hmm. and just people who are you know, creepy and kooky and mysterious and ooky. <laughs> um, or, or just being into like, yep. The ideal family, if you will. Exactly. <laughs> or just being into like <laughs> mythology and uh, unusual cultural beliefs and, mm -hmm. and, and monsters and, and strange beings and the fae and things like that. I just sort of always gravitated to that sort of idea of outsiders, things that aren't a part of my everyday life because the everyday life was just around me and it was, it was fine. It was there, but there are all these things at the fringes that, you know, will kind of draw my eye. And so that was always as a, a sort of an introduction, just getting me into this openness, I guess, to the idea of the weird and the strange and the different and the outsider. And then I don't know, I mean, I, I view this as kind of a personality touchstone of mine just growing up, and I don't know if it has anything to do with me getting into the subculture or not, but the the pseudo trauma that I went through around fourth grade, uh, I grew up, you know, mostly lived in Colorado, um, in Denver area, Littleton, and um, in fourth grade, my dad changed jobs, and we moved mm. to Chicago, mm. and I basically, you know, moved several states away. I are you did me? not. I had a very, Maybe. I, everything you said I have experienced, <laughs> and I also had a, sim, a similar thing, not moving states, but moving from one school to another school around the same age. Okay. Uh, I mean, which was possible. traumatic for me, which is yeah. fucking I mean, for weird. Me, Why it is was fourth grade always the worst? If we make <laughs> out, are we just going to cease to exist? Is that what's... Is that what... <laughs> no, I think that would be us being opposite. <laughs> it's just like... Okay. Because that's anti-matter and anti-matter is the, okay. the, the, the destruction. <laughs> So if we're doppelgangers, I don't, I, mean, I don't really know what that would do. Just have great sex, I think, is, is what would happen. It could be. It's sort of that, that reinforcing, that Stack amplification like of a that's wave that's in phase. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. But, uh -huh. but yeah, so, you know, moving several states away totally rebooted my social life. I did not maintain ties with anybody. I still don't have any regained ties with anybody that I knew, you know, prior to that fourth grade move. I mean, I still, I mean, I do hold, and I think part of it is because of this, this forced reboot of my social life, I tend to hold social ties lightly. I'm not good at necessarily keeping in touch with people and, and making sure I, I keep those relationships solid. Um, and I think some of that is related to that, but that was a major touchstone of my life, this, this need to basically reinvent myself. And part of what happened at that point is I lost any sense of self. So going through that latter half of grade school, junior high, high school, I was, I basically acted as the blank slate. My mindset was, I just want to not be noticed. I'm just mm. going to fade in the background. Nobody will bother me. I won't bother anybody. I'm just sort of, I am nobody. And I managed that very well, which is probably why, unlike some other people. Gosh, you're in so this, lucky. Yeah. Unlike some other people in the <laughs> subculture who have 
you know, laundry lists of of problems in high school and grade school of being picked on and bullied and being the weird kid. I was the weird kid, but enough under the radar that I was more the invisible kid than the weird kid that stuck out and got hammered down. So I had a generally benign experience through those years. And I had my small group of friends. I wasn't this little hermit who'd go to school and then go home and play by myself all the time. But it was a very limited environment. And then I learned late in high school and then developed through college how to kind of break out of that feeling this need to be invisible and just become myself and be comfortable in being myself in public. And if that means I stick out a little bit more, I stick out. I still have all of those skills that I can vanish as needed. And I can't say I don't use them uh, at this point still. So we could always just ask, what brought you to the vampire that you are? <laughs> obfuscate <laughs> power. I have obfuscate power. I do. You are yeah. So ironically, <laughs> oh, oh! for the brief Rude. period that I uh, played VT, I did I did LARP. Um, I think uh, now I'm now I'm blanking on the name of the, all the clans for some stupid reason. Um, yeah, I was just I was gonna, Toriador, yeah, I know, right? Gangrel, Nosferatu. Yep. So I, the first clan I, totally I joined was Gangrel. To the Toriador clan. Ah, the very okay. first clan I was Gangrel, but the clan I was in longest was Toriador. Mm. which is not the clan for my previously expressed <laughs> See, I went the other way. I, I started, I thought for most of my life I was a Toreador, but now I think I'm more of a, a Bruja, actually, which is not the same as Gangrel, but, you know. Punk! No, I'm, I'm full on Shimise. You punk rocker? So, you know, I'm just all Shimise. So <laughs> That's yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. I heard just general nerds. <laughs> just... You fucking dork as they flushy my, my hair in the <laughs> toilet. Yeah. No, my dude, dude. <laughs> though, though, yes, my, my two favorite abilities were probably obfuscation and alacrity. So. Mm, mm hmm. Um, uh, I'm I'm glad I grew into my I'm glad I grew into my character sheet. Let's just put <laughs> it like good. that. I like that. I, <laughs> I like. I that. feel like I did. That's, that's funny. Good. Zachary knows, or I don't know if if they know, but they've at least met and have talked to uh, Jason Carl. So I've toyed around with asking Jason Carl to be on the podcast, but I don't think I could make enough of a <gasps> connection to be to not just devolve into talking about nerdy vampire the masquerade stuff but any, sorry anyway that was a whole that I, was a one whole would not e one would not even blame you yeah like sure, there is yeah. I, i'm i nerd I love out Jason. so hard He's, over that uh, art yeah yeah, the, yeah yeah everything i mean oh God, that's a whole section of my life sorry anyway the book of nod uh, yeah I know. jesus i'm just like oh yeah duh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, delicious. <laughs> I just actually not uh, a month or two ago. I had Sarah read uh, the fragments of Eurice. I don't know how you pronounce it, or Eurices or Eurace. How, how do you say that? It's a. It's like a. It, it was a. It was one of the books that came out that was like a supposed to be an addendum to the Book of Nod. It was like they discovered some older version of Book of Nod that had like commentary and stuff in it anyway i had sarah read it for the first time and she was like oh this is pretty dope actually i'm i'm into vampire the masquerade stuff so ah oh, that's sexy i like it <laughs> um so sorry you were talking about being a child <laughs> yeah i was talking about being a child. <laughs> wait what? Um, well actually i, I, I got in past being a child i talked about my young you know trauma and then mm -hmm. the rebuilding of my identity from that point when i went down to blank slate so, I mean, that's kind of where it was. So I kind of held on to still that, that being drawn to the weird and the outsider. While also, since I broke down my identity and built it up from scratch, that might be where I get my idea that I'm not interested in being part of a group. And also my sort of hesitance to, to grab onto those big social ties. So the idea of an a la carte personality fits with that. And the idea of being myself and being self-sufficient in that, not necessarily needing that outside validation, I think all comes from that. And that definitely informs my personality in general, in addition to you know, my personality and relationship with the, the goth scene in general. Um, and it's, it's interesting that you know, the goth scene always you know, has a sort of relationship with horror movies. 
And I don't. I'm not really much of a horror movie fan. I'm not averse to them. I don't hate horror movies. Um, but I'm also not you, drawn to them either, at least not in the, I guess, the traditional. It's, it's more the slasher genres that I'm less drawn to because a good psychological thriller, a good thing that's scary without the visuals, because I like that idea of the hidden danger um, mm-hmm. more than the danger that's just right there in the face tearing out your throat. That mm. doesn't really appeal to me. As Ricardo Islas would say, you don't in any good monster movie, you don't see all of the mm-hmm. monster right away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what he would always say. <laughs> Whereas some of my favorites, you don't see any of the monster. And sometimes, mm-hmm. some of the best ones, the monster is never shown, but the true monster is shown, and that's the people. And those are probably mm-hmm. some of my favorite sort of horror movies is when the existence of, of the possible danger, the potential monster, the... Mm-hmm whatever at the gates that's never shown reveals that the people around you are the ones that have the most potential to be the monster. See, but I think that's why I got into horror movies in the first place, because I felt like that was a more uh, grounded and real exploration of what it meant to be afraid and what it meant to be the, you know, as much of a trope as it is the kind of the people are the monsters the whole time. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt like that genre was the best way to explore those feelings as opposed to like the, you know, whatever else I was watching. I I mean, action movies are obvious are always thrown up as the like, Oh, you just kill millions of people with no consequence because it's an action movie. So I felt like there was a more, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's why right. I like kung fu yeah. movies. Usually they're not killing. I'm not like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Actually, it's, it's funny that too. you mentioned that, Trey, because I was totally going to recommend Rigor Mortis to you okay. just now. If you've never seen it, it's um, it's one of those ch- Chinese vampire movies where you're just like, oh my god. I, you're like, what is this even? <laughs> and then you have to like kind of just like figure it out at the end. And you're like, what the hell? And those so, mind and fuck part of you at the horror end. films are yeah. the best. I love those. You're talking the, like, I haven't seen it, but I just looked it up. This is the 2013 Hong Kong horror film. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I may look it up. I mean, I do find Asian horror to be particularly unsettling. Um, it is. Possibly <laughs> because one of the first ones I saw was, I think, The Audition. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which was yeah. terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do have some control issues and the idea of being mm. totally unable See, that's to why be it's good. in control of my, I know it yeah. reflects yourself back at you. It makes you think about it. That's it why the does. horror genre and is I, great. I get it. And I do enjoy a lot of uh, there. I don't, like I said, I'm not completely against horror movies. I do watch a fair amount of them, but I'm very careful with them. Mm-hmm. And I do prefer I hear what you're saying. You want to dedicate thrillers. your mind you want to dedicate your mind to something that you find engaging and like something as base and, and kind of you like know, torture common. Porn. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, you're just like, okay. That's really like the core whatever. of it is I don't enjoy seeing other people in suffer. Pain. Yeah. I I'm it's, the same it's way. seeing other people mm-hmm. suffer and being in pain. Now seeing other people get scared or seeing scary situations and how people respond to that, that I don't have a problem with, but watching the blatant torment of an individual, mm-hmm. Um, is yeah. a complete and total turnoff to me, yeah. which is why the torture porn genre is as fascinating as I found reading the synopses of the entire Saw series. Mm-hmm. I have zero interest mm-hmm. in actually watching it, but the I underlying really hate the uh, purge idea too. God, it's terrible. The purge is very interesting too, and I've also read synopses of the purge. I think as I, a concept, a lot of... it's interesting, but the the execution as a concept, is not but... good. Yeah, so I mean, a yeah. lot of those I've I've you know gone to their Wikipedia page read plot synopses, read analyses, and find the, the, the topics that they wrestle with, the ideas they wrestle with to be fascinating. But I don't necessarily want to watch it. I'm fine just yes, understanding the that. underlying concepts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I do find mm-hmm, that interesting. Mm-hmm. And so that's wh- yeah. where I engage in a lot of horror. Um, but that's also why I gravitate to the horror that doesn't show, where it it's always this tension in the background and it's probably part of it because I, I like the reactions. I like the philosophical concepts. I don't feel the need or maybe I'm just not comfortable enough seeing the actual physiological horror of people 
suffering and or being eviscerated and spurting mm-hmm. gouts of blood and yeah. all that stuff doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. So that's kind of where I stand I get it. on things. Yeah. And that is part of why I gravitate more towards vampire flicks, especially the quote unquote elegant vampire mm-hmm. flicks mm-hmm. in the in the vein of it's of the pleasure your, uh, and the pain. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's the beauty it's, it's and pretty. it's a it's sexual pretty. thing. It's it pretty, pretty. <laughs> and usually the fact that there's a lot of death is kind of sidelined or the death is a peaceful it's release. It's pretty death though. Yeah, it's it's a peaceful <laughs> release. It's not somebody screaming uh-huh. in pain. It is an, a, a loving embrace and watching one's life yeah. just leak. That's why I would let John out. do whatever he wants to me. Sorry. <laughs> I'll let him know. <laughs> and also maybe part Sexy. of why the, the whole Jean, zombie watch. milieu completely turns me off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the complete opposite. All right. Um, so I guess I'll just be, I'll go real quick on this. I, mm, this, this is hard for me because my, I hate this question because the, <laughs> I, I don't think about my past because my past, like my childhood and my, and my teenage years and everything, it was like, it feels like it was such a waste of my life that I just move on and continue, you know, take the kind of lessons I've learned of, about myself specifically and about my behavior and what kind of behaviors that can be uh, problems and toxic for other people, but forget about everything else basically because it's not me anymore. I'm not that person and I don't care about that person. So this is this is hard for me to think about. Um, I, I think the kind of themes that I took out of thinking about uh, uh, the psychology of getting into goth or whatever. I didn't think about this in psychological terms because I also, that's one of the other things about myself is I like to intellectualize concepts so that I can avoid the emotional impact of it. So I tried to not put this into like uh-huh. psychological terms when I was thinking about it. But similar to, to both of you, I was always kind of trying to deviate from the environment that I was in. Um, so I was always kind of grabbing onto anything that I ran into that was alternative. I remember, um, the first time I saw somebody wear, um, the kind of spray on hair dye, that's not hair dye, but the spray on hair color to school. I begged my parents (laughs) for months to let me do that because I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And then they only let me do it on one of my birthdays. Uh, and so I bought as many colors as I could. And then I asked people to call me Skittles and it was this whole cringy, like home video thing that I have. I think that's a uh, wonderful thing. That's so cute. I love Skittles. Shut the hell up. That's, that's adorable. Uh, Can I call you Skittles? No, please still? don't. Please don't. <laughs> uh, this shouldn't be on the internet. Um, <laughs> so, so that was a thing. Um, I got really, for a long time, I got, and again, this is all Christian music, but I got really into rap and hip hop because that was the first kind of uh, different or subversive thing that I discovered. And then I got really into metal. Um, As far as like media goes, I was really into spooky and atmospheric stuff. I remember the beginning of um, uh, uh, E.T. specifically. I watched that like dozens of times because it was just it seems stupid to me now but at the time it was just atmosphere it was because it was their backyard it was at night it was foggy the swing the swing set was moving on its own and they were like oh what's going on with this there's weird things happening and you don't know what it is and I, so i was always drawn to those kinds of things um i as a kid i was always interested in individuality and kind of kind of more like questioning why there were norms and expectations you know why was there for like my environment why was there such a strict dress code for going to certain places why was there such a strict expectation for conversation in public settings you know i wanted to question why were those boundaries there and did they make any sense or were they completely arbitrary and i was constantly uh, poking my parents with these questions i remember one time i came home uh, a friend of mine at school who was an atheist asked me, I don't remember what the question was, but he asked me something about Moses, which seemed like a defeater to some argument I was trying to make about some biblical truth. And I came home and I asked my mom about it. And she told me she didn't have an answer to the question. But then she went on this whole thing about, you know, 
she was concerned about me asking these questions and, oh, are you questioning if God is real? And are you worried about, and I was like, no, I just, I just had a question about something and your extreme response to thinking that I was leaving the faith because I questioned something makes me even more concerned about what's happening in the first place. You're like, excuse me? (laughs) Um, Yeah. So, and so, so that process, you know, I, I just, I don't know what it was. I would just, I liked the dark spooky stuff. I liked exploring those elements of existence that were real, but were kind of ignored by most people. And that has continued to me, uh, for me, um, till today. Uh, and then I think the only other theme that I could think of was the notion of creating your own lineage and building your own chosen family. Um, that was always mm-hmm. important to me, not because I, I hated my family, but my, my family felt to me more like, I guess, uh, kind of like college dorm roommates where I didn't get to pick who they were and we didn't have a lot in common. We didn't hate each other, but we had to live with each other. So I, mm-hmm. I always felt like there could be out there somewhere a more emotional and, and deeper connection to that word of family that I wasn't experiencing. So from an early age for me, that was something I was trying to seek out was that l- kind of like-minded community and what can that emotional connection feel like with people that you actually love and that you actually have a lot in common and challenge each other with rather than just people you're forced to live with. Um, See, that past was totally valuable. You understood outliers and what it meant to have a sense of community. Yeah, sure, I guess. I don't know. That's what I was looking for. (laughs) (laughs) So Cool. So, all right, well, we're at two hours. I think the the question how to get back into goth is hilarious and (laughs) awesome. But but also something that might require more than a few minutes. Um, yeah. Hey, which is got to say that last cool, question but... is the only one that has a, any sort of draw to me. The, the music one has been done Beaten to death. to death. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, we killed it with, a, with several different tools. <laughs> <laughs> and I have zero opinion on World Goth Day. I, yeah, I, it's just another... It's like World Muffin Day. It's like, I don't know. It's one of those another... Like, I get it's, it. It's a, it's a day that, other than the people who are part of the subculture, no one even knows about in general. It's probably a Tuesday. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think my... <laughs> yeah. I think, I think where I was going to go with that was more thinking about um, what I saw as the underlying theme of that, of being complaining about online communities being shallow. And try to explore I could that. see that. I mean, I saw where you were going with that, and I, I, I dig where the direction. I think that there's just the other two or three are a little bit yeah, more. I'd um, say a discussion of goths and Halloween is more important than goths and World Goth Day. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, and we did both of the and the online thing. We did an episode in 2016 called uh, "The Internet versus Goth," where we explored that a lot. Um, mm-hmm. so I don't, I don't know, unless okay. any of you want to, so you're done. yeah, the, how to get back into goth, that thing, um, we're actually doing an episode next month about, um, uh-huh. being, uh, like it's, the theme is baby bat one Oh one, like how to get into goth. So I think, I feel like that's mm-hmm. going to kind of cover the same. We should have in like an older one that like, Oh, I'm done with this now. And I'd like to go back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've definitely done that. I've never, you know, escaped or left goth entirely, but there was years in my life, especially while I was married and moving around, that mm-hmm. I wasn't paying any attention to the scene, wasn't paying attention to the music, wasn't paying attention to the subculture. And I had this giant gap between about 2000 and 2010 where I just, I don't know. I mean, that's how I missed a lot of the bands that people talk about now mm. that were key at that period. I'm like, I know of them now because I've, gone back and paid attention to them but um there's a a good gap where i just was not engaged i never felt like i was i left i never called myself an ex-goth or anything like that but i just stopped Mm -hmm. being engaged with it because i was dealing with other things in my life yeah i mean and there's people that are have to move undercover quote unquote Mm -hmm. to different places like dj thrall like he's uh out in the middle of the boonies with a 
bunch of rednecks and <laughs> he doesn't know he's like oh, i gotta keep that secret <laughs> mm-hmm. so, so i mean i could definitely talk about that but i don't think we need to so you got me interested in death it's the last great taboo it's the only taboo left precisely i mean why is it do you think that everyone in here is dressed in black it's a celebration of death no, i just like the clothes mm. Yeah, well, no, I mean, the clothes look good. Yeah, I mean, death looks good. Charles Manson, yeah? No, he was cool. Mm. Don't know if I mentioned it before, but I'm actually a vampire. <laughs> Sinister suggestions. I will never not recommend Johan Wait. Like, mm. Ohne Dich. Like, that song just makes me cry. He's um, German, over 70 years old, still doing tours and making music. And why? Because they v- value art in Europe. Oh, John's Joachim Wick, because my accent is atrocious. <laughs> John just oh, corrected John. me, y'all. <laughs> John, John, John. And, um, and also Aesthetic Perfections um, cover of one of Placebo songs. John, what the heck is it called again? Is it called what? Out, okay. <laughs> no. John, aesthetics, aesthetic perfections cover one of placebo songs. What was it called again? I'm sorry, Solar Fakes. Um, oh, Solar Cover fake. of one of placebo songs. I my my totally my bad. Like I'm having a brain fart. It's like uh, been two hot and take. Half solar Fake is better than Aesthetic Perfection, but <laughs> hold on. <laughs> there we go. That's the one I was thinking of. Dear God, and it's and it's to say goodbye. Like those mm. that one in particular. Like Solar Fake's cover of that one song was like, oh, he didn't just kill it. Like that song, he just he slaughtered it mercilessly with his teeth like a savage beast. <laughs> I just, I fucking loved it. To it was thro- so, to, so, to so, throw so back good. to our previous episode, mm. kind of reference that uh, the lead singer of Solar Fake and lead singer of Aesthetic Perfection also tall, scrawny, beak nosed, uh, pale. Uh, stereotypical so, like, goth dudes so uh yeah totally my type obviously <laughs> uh trey what do you got so what i got and i don't remember what went down brought me down this path i think it was maybe something mentioned in the previous uh podcast or something spun this google search and i looked up goth jazz because mm, okay. i never really you know looked into that before and of course one of the first things that came up was was a reddit post with people decrying the merging of genres and you know jazz is just jazz you can't why does it have to be this jazz and that jazz why can't it just be jazz jazz but what what i did get from it is while there isn't necessarily an official quote-unquote goth jazz genre there's an entire group of artists that are in what would be called doom jazz dark jazz and jazz noir okay so those are sort of the semi-official ones and sort of the 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 I guess what most people would know of or an artist that most people would know or something that they would see that would be an exemplar of that would be the film scores for, um, you know, Angelo, but ba- Angelo ba- Badalamenti's film scores um, for David Lynch movies, basically is that mm. sort of idea, your twin peaks and things like that. Um, so that's kind of the, the pop culture touchstone. But some of the bands that I've been getting into, um, one of them that I really loved was is called uh, the Dark, uh, what is it? The Kilimanjaro Dark Jazz Ensemble. Woo! Um, they do have a Bandcamp page, okay. which I'll, I'll send you so you can post. I've really been enjoying their stuff. It is very sort of noir but also very atmospheric. And, you know, sort of that atmospheric, spooky, shoegazy thing mixed with that sort of jazz noir kind of um, sort of slinky, sexy thing that that you get within that whole genre. Um, another band that gets mentioned a lot is uh, Bohren and their Club of Gore, which okay. is another very interesting noir jazz band. I didn't. They didn't grab me as much as the dark jazz ensemble did, but um, I thought they were very good. And then the the one of the third ones I mentioned is definitely screaming out that Twin Peaks reference is the uh, Dale Cooper Quartet and the Dictaphones. Um, so there's another a couple of bands. 
And I just, I really have enjoyed discovering this whole pseudo subgenre. I mean, I do listen to jazz, but not a ton. And I have always gravitated to some of the, the sort of darker, slinkier ones. And I, I, I mean, I love the soundtracks by Angela. You are a band, Beats Antique listener, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> I am a Boots Antique listener. Yeah, yeah, um, called it. And and yeah, I, um, we've already discussed a little bit, but I do like the uh, cabaret revival and stuff that I know you're quite sick of since oh, you've had to so perform good. to so much of it. Oh yeah, but I haven't had to perform <laughs> to it, so I can maintain my love of it. Um, <laughs> that also true. No, I mean I don't hate it. It's just kind of it's done, done for me at this yeah. point. But yeah, Swing yeah. Revival um, and Modern Cabaret uh, Revival were definitely touchstones for me that I've really enjoyed. But yeah, this dark jazz thing, it was a great discovery. So I want to share that, um, I, get people interested in that. I Something almost, a little bit outside the norm, still within the I like that. goth milieu. I, yeah, it's cool because, I mean, yeah. you had like, uh, you know, in the past, I feel like in the 2000s, you had more experimentation with... I mean, the 2000s is kind of a desert of goth music, but you had experimentation <laughs> with other stuff like, um, um, uh, is it, is it Cabaret, Cabaret Voltaire? But like Dark Cabaret and, you know, weird, uh, I'm, well, all Cabaret the Voltaire bands I'm wouldn't really of, be Dark Cabaret. That would not be, Cabaret I mean, Vot well, the I'm big, thinking of someone the else. The big Dark um, Cabaret. Cinema Strange, Cinema Strange. Yeah, Cinema Strange would be um, a Cinema good Strange. example, or any um, of the Amanda Palmer stuff is an example within mm -hmm. sort of the goth. There are a few, there, there's some other uh, goth bands that at the goth and industrial bands at the edge of my brain right now that I'm not thinking of that experimented with like strange sounds um, mm -hmm. and like other genres that aren't typically in mm -hmm. the goth genre, but made that kind of a sound. And I think that's sorely, we have all kinds of um, incredible new music right now, but that yeah. really like outskirts kind of stuff is missing. And so I like that. I'm going to check those bands out for sure. Yeah. I mean, there was also the the mm -hmm. whole small, short lived trip hop movement in the seventies or yeah. the nineties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, God, I freaking love trip hop. I do too. Still. Trip I can't hop's even great, <laughs> and I really got into trip hop, and I played lots of trip hop in my goth sets in the nineties when I was doing music. Oh, I'd hell mix yeah. it in. It's funny. With all those things. I, I've heard arguments that there are there's literally only one or two actual trip hop bands, and the idea of trip hop as a genre is just a misnomer. Uh, that there are actually other genres, and it's not a real thing, but. I don't know enough about that argument to actually I, explain it. So. Me neither. Yeah. I just, I, I think I know what it is. And if, if it is what I think it is, I love it. Yeah. For me, <laughs> it's, it's, it's in that, that genre of I don't care. It, it's a, yeah. I know that bands <laughs> that have been called like trip hop, yeah. a band that's been called trip hop is something I like. And when I've looked mm -hmm. up other bands that are called trip hop, it is also something that I like. And that is the function of a genre yes. to me. Mm -hmm. So yes. it works for me in that sense, yes, even if it's not smart. necessarily an official codified large scale genre. Mm -hmm. and shouldn't be given that official uh, sanction, but it leads me to music I like, and that's all that really matters to me. Speaking of like really kick-ass hybrid things, um, one thing that I almost, I never want to, I never ever ever want to forget to mention this because it's such a weird amalgamation, but like um, Satanic Country has been something oh, that yeah. I've really been into. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I've, I've looked up. <laughs> I don't I just like really, it. <laughs> I not a lot of people do, but like freaking Matt King is like boss as fuck. Like he's it, it's not like it's not country like you know ding ding like twangy mm -hmm. shit. It's like more like have you ever seen like Breaking Bad? Yeah. He he's played a, a few songs for that particular series oh. and yeah, like he he'd have something like you know Hell's Kitchen mm -hmm. or um. Eden's Apple, which was, you know, um, like he sings about like burning Bibles on the mountain. Mm. It's, it's fucking Long cool. Like that. it's not exactly, yeah, it's not exactly what you would call goth per se, but it does resonate on, it, it like gives you, it, it kind of broadens your horizons a little bit and like, but still speaking to, you know, feels and interests and i mean it's it's, and, and it's definitely like the that. path that something like nick cave will will take you towards oh sure yeah. um, yes not yes. to mention He's, just the yeah. actual genres of gothabilly psychobilly right right um, mm -hmm. goes down that path yeah, as well. yeah yeah but it's been my preferred 
song uh it's been my preferred performance song of choice is is has been that recently for whatever cool. reason yeah no, I, I have a couple of yeah. i haven't listened to them that much but i have a couple of spotify playlists that i grabbed and picked up that were sort of dark country gothic country type things because i do enjoy some country music um and some of the storytelling murder ballad type things that tends to murder ballad that's be why it is so cool where you know where those <laughs> bands tend to gravitate to and I, I love it you know give me my you yeah. know, johnny cash and you know some of those darker yeah story country bands that aren't necessarily about the the twangy sort of pop country nowadays but that mm -mm. sort of gritty gritty roots country is definitely where i gravitate towards yeah there was actually yeah, a really yeah. big uh the bluegrass revival that happened in the maybe 2010s early 2010s um had a lot of that um some decent bands that i'm blanking on right now but kind of have sort of a, a dark gloomy bluegrassy type feel yeah that might have been where it all stemmed from i'm not entirely sure all i know is that like just within yeah i guess the last decade i was like seriously into that shit yeah. like well, i mean there's, there's <laughs> been a dark undercurrent within country music since its inception um true so there's always been some it, it's hard to find and especially nowadays where it does tend to be very not necessarily shiny happy but very celebratory of a certain kind of lifestyle and a certain kind of nationalism mm -hmm. sometimes too mm -hmm. um, as far as the pop country side of things um and then there's always my my amusement, the brief period when I heard about hick hop. That was something that oh, amused stop. me. Oh, yeah. That is so funny. Yeah, hick hop definitely amused me. But I didn't necessarily find anything in there that really like, oh, this is really cool. It was more like, I'm yeah. amused by this. Kind of like nerdcore rap. No, it's funny. I'm kind of amused by yeah. this. But it's not, <clears throat> didn't really grab me as something that really, oh, my God, this is life changing. But it's like, you know what? I kind of dig. People mixing it up more. And that's and that's what it's all about. Evolution. Mm -hmm. <sighs> all right. I'm trying to find there's this band. I'm trying to find this fucking band. One of their songs, one of the, their most popular song was the lyrics were basically uh they go A to Z of people's names and then sing about how that person died. And oh, I know what you're, <laughs> I know what you're, um, I can't think they had a bunch of like kooky, goofy songs like that. And I can't, it's not the butthole surfers, is it? No, no, no. I was just thinking that think too. Of, it was like a kind <laughs> of like, like, that can't be it. Bum, 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 kind of like, uh, um, like a carnival esque kind of sound to it. I'm also thinking of Edward Gorey now, I too. I can't but that's think not of the song. goddamn band. This is one of those things that I'll figure out while i'm editing i feel like john would know that i i'm trying like i'm trying to think of some of the lyrics because i dj'd this i played this song when i dj'd a few times and i cannot remember any of the lyrics to this song so i can't find it on google i'm suddenly but, feeling a little less horrible about blanking on all my whatever. shit earlier yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's also kind of reminding me of 88 lines about 44 women but that's nothing no, that's, with, yeah, that's deaths yeah. or anything but yeah the the Butthole Surfer song is the first one that came to mind. Uh, so, well, that anyway, that aside, my uh, my sinister suggestion is a short film called Blood Machines. Um, you can only, uh, at least as far as I'm aware, you can only currently stream this on uh, Shudder. So the way that I watched this was by doing their seven-day free trial thing. Um, yeah. It's... It's it's one of those it's hyper stylized. It's kind of like um kind of like Bl Blade Runner on crack in a way, but it's <laughs> it's very it's a short film. Uh the soundtrack was done by Carpenter Brute, so the music I was really in love with. And then the the visuals and the story are sci-fi. So um I don't really want to give away the themes of it because if you watch it, I think that's that's you just said sci-fi, and I'm like there. Um, so it was so called, yeah. There's uh, there's spaceships. They're on alien planets. There's um, AIs transcending into uh, naked goddesses who have inverted 
crosses uh, on their chests and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's like this: the cinematic, the most uh, salient part of this is the 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 visuals, which is are very like CGI blended with character actors that are. It's it has it, it plays with a sort of uh, dichotomies a lot because there's like hyper stylized sci fi graphics where it cut to like somebody in this spaceship playing country like old country music. So it's it's re, it's this like kind of real like surreal. Okay, so I watched this stoned the first time, but I I watched it sober the second time. So <laughs> it was like, weird. Hang on. I, but wait. <laughs> um, it's so it's it's they play with a lot of dichotomies and that kind of thing, which I think I think makes for a real textured and rich, and and unique setting. Uh, but it's kind of it's kind of similar to like uh kung uh what was that kung fu kung fury, um, kung kung fury. fury. yeah it's kind of similar to that in the stylization except it's even more extreme than kung fury in the sort of like insanity of of the visuals but the story itself is i think interesting there's not a lot of dialogue but it's is essentially a feminist story of of kind of women taking their agency and taking their power and destroying uh the 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 patriarchy and like the the male system that has kept them in place and tried to try to make their bodies into objects and tried to make them into less than human so that part of it was really cool but it it was a little weird because parts of the of the film can feel kind of male gazy because there's a, a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of almost excessive close up shots of just naked female bodies which it's like i don't know cuz i think it was directed by a guy so i feel a bit That conflicted. almost sounds like robots and I haven't seen that. Wait, what the hell was it called? Uh yeah, no, it was like a a bunch of short it was it was really fucking good, but mm-hmm. it was like it was a bunch of short mm. um of uh futuristic stuff. It was I, I think it was called Love Sex and Robots or something like oh, that. Oh, Love Sex and Robots. Yeah, yeah. I watched I I did see that. That's on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I have that. That on was my a mixed bag as well. Cute to watch and I haven't yet. It was. Um, what was the what was the name of the thing that you suggested? Uh, Blood Machines. Daniel? Okay, I'm writing it down because. But it's it's really good. I think it's worth a watch. It's short too. It's the way it's weird because I feel I, I think it was actually aired at um, what are those like the 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 uh, the festivals where they show movies? What are those called? Movie festivals. Movie festivals. Yeah, there's a thing. <laughs> I mean, are you talking about like uh, Cannes, sun, like Sundance kind of <laughs> Sundance yeah, that kind of thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I feel like it was a an entire thing, but the way that um uh they showed it on the streaming services, they split it into three like twenty minute episodes with mm-hmm. credits and an intro an intro thing, which it was unique, but it was a little weird. I felt a little disjointed that way. Um. But yeah, the music is great. I feel like people who who are into industrial and goth music would really like the music, and the visuals are just crazy. If you like, uh, it felt not like the first Blade Runner, the the sequel to Blade Runner, which was really visually stunning. It felt like that, but hyper stylized and 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 on LSD basically. Um, so it, it was it was incredible to watch and it's only like 50 minutes or so so that's that was uh that was the highlight of my month so far i think so that your your sort of synopsis about it as far as the feminist side of it with women taking control it, it reminds me a lot of a book i actually just read and uh we have a book club at work and hmm. the, the last voting we had had several books that i'd already read and then one sci-fi book that i hadn't and I don't think the sci-fi book was winning because I definitely, I strongly recommended everybody read uh, Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi, Co- Ta-Nehisi Coates because mm-hmm. I thought that was a really, really, really good book, but I'd already read it. So I'm not reading that again. But another book was called The Power, and it's a mm-hmm. sci-fi book that was just recently, I mean, released a few years ago by uh, Naomi Alderman. And the premise of that is that for some reason, women develop an ability to basically project electrical force from their bodies, basically become human tasers. Mm -hmm. And with certain (laughs) control can actually directly target pain sensors, Mm -hmm. uh, pain centers as well. And because of the development of this power and that only women developed it, um, there was a shift in gender uh, power, basically, Mm because all of a sudden women could fight back in a way that just could not be met. 
Um, and so there was this whole feminist narrative about women taking the control of the reins of power, taking over countries. And it, it's written from the perspective of a future society looking at artifacts from several thousand years in the future. Okay. Which is kind of the framing That's device. Cool. I mean, most of the yeah. story takes place at the time when the change happened. So it is mostly done that, but there's these framing devices where it's future people looking back at historical and archaeological evidence and trying to make sense of it. And that future world was one that had been thousands of years of matriarchy. Mm -hmm. So female dominance is mm -hmm. the norm. Mm -hmm. And there is some joking in asides about, you know, kind of what we hear nowadays where, you know, they're saying, you know, oh yeah, well, this this is such an interesting myth. And, you know, it'd be so much much more of a nice, peaceful world and, and a sexier world if if men were in charge and, mm. you know, and all that, which is kind of, you know, what I've heard said at least many years ago about, you know, if women were in charge, right, yeah. things wouldn't be so violent and, and things would be peaceful and it would be nice to see all these sexy women in places of power instead of stodgy old men. So it, it, it was flipping that on its head. And it's, it, there's a lot of romanticism is, that goes behind, but it's also, it's a course. very, very good critique yeah. of that mindset too. the idea that there'd be this amazing sea change when the people with ultimate power simply have different genitals. Um, and so there, there is a critique well, of that concept is. in the story, um, which is, which I find that very is a too. whole loaded cannon full of conversation right it there. <laughs> it, was, it was a very interesting book. I, I enjoyed it. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, mind blowing or absolutely to die for, but it was an enjoyable book. Um, but it, it's mm -hmm. similar to what you were saying with, with women yeah. developing, either giving themselves, which is what it sounds like Blood Machine was doing, or just naturally developing something that can change the power dynamic between the genders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also, I mean, there's a, another theme which, like, I, I think is still interesting, but is more of a trope in science fiction about the, you know, what is the threshold between artificial intelligence and humanity and like, mm -hmm. what does it mean to be human? That's also Did part you of. See that? Huh? There's a, there's a movie coming out. Speaking of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and movies called B and it's having a, like the first ever robot as a female lead. And I find that. Perfectly I uh, interesting. Is that just B E E? Or I assume we no, just, just one B. E or one B. E, I assume. The letter B. Okay, I'll look at it. Oh, just the, no, I haven't heard of that. It, yeah, it's it's an interesting concept. I feel like a lot of people are um balking at it. A um because maybe it's because uh I don't know if it's because the robot is technically a woman of color, Erica? which I thought was interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I found it. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, yep, mm -hmm. I found it too. Yeah, yeah. Um, or whether or not it's because they didn't give the part to a regular, you know, like an actual woman of color or whatever. But I see a lot of people balking at it because it's a an actual robot, and maybe it's you know fixed towards the male gaze. And then there's other people mm -hmm. who are like dead afraid of the Terminator happening. And I'm like, part of me, the only part of me that saw the negative re reviews about it were of men who are afraid of robots and like that there was that one part of me that was like well if you're not a shitty person you don't have to worry about backlash so what are all you men afraid mm. of <laughs> I've, I've seen a lot of headlines recently about um voice actors stepping down from roles where they were voicing people of color but they were white uh, and I think that's mm -hmm. good. And at going back to the last no, of us too the character the character who is uh trans in that uh game is voiced and motion captured by a trans man. So I think that was really oh, cool. That's awesome. So it's mm -hmm. nice to see that that's changing. Yes, it is. And it's insane to me that that wasn't like you're going to have a black character not played by a black person. Like, why? What? It's weird. Why? So I mean, that's a gigantic weight of historical precedent. Yeah. That, why? Yeah. I, <laughs> I understand why. It's just, it, like, don't do that is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, you're Agreed. like, that's toxic. No. All right, cool. So we're almost at three hours. So that's it. <laughs> you will have some editing to do. <laughs> Just like last uh, time. We're really good at this. That was fun. No, that was fun. So um, I, I'll say, uh, so yeah, so yeah, it, Lady India, thank you so much, of course, for hanging out. It's always nice to hang out with you. Thank you. But specifically. It was my pleasure. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Uh, yes, thank you. Do you want to um, remind? Of course, I'll thank have you. links. Everybody knows there's links in the show notes to your stuff. 
would you like to mention again where people can go to look at um, your your things and stuff? <laughs> my things and stuff. stuff you can look things. at my things and stuff <laughs> on, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can go to Instagram. I'll be there. Um, I have never left. Uh, let's see. What on earth is my, what's my link name on this thing? Okay. It's Lady India. It sounds like how it's spelled. Underscore R-A-K-S. It's a cute little play on words there. Um, I went the teeny bopper route and I got myself a TikTok. Oh, <laughs> oh. I'm on TikTok. I did it. Seven. So you're gonna have to watch. Gonna... Time to watch Lady Inda do all the TikTok. Here we go. Dances. Here we go. What is it? Yeah, you'll see a little bit of John's and antics too. It's at Lady India on TikTok. So it's freaky polymath powers over eighteen, dark, sticky vampire fun, and cats. Um, right, I already followed you. There we go. <laughs> oh snap! <laughs> <laughs> oh hey, there you hey, are. John. Hey, the count. Yeah, exactly. He's my latest <laughs> post. John is my latest post. <laughs> He's petting a squirrel. Um, two solar fake. Um, and let's see. There is uh, also my le- um, Facebook pages account, which is Lady India Official. So you can go visit that as well. Awesome. Yeah, I'm all over the place. <laughs> all right, I've had enough whiskey. I'm going to bed. That's going to do it for us this month. I know that sounds like it's going to be a long time before we come back. But like I said at the beginning of the show, be sure, if you haven't already, to check out the Belfry Network. And there's a bunch of stuff there that I'm sure can hold you over. Otherwise, join us on uh, Patreon. Jump into the Discord. There's a bunch of people there hanging out, chatting about things. And actually, that's my segue into our Patreon members before I tease what's coming up next month. Of course, this show only exists because you beautiful people decide to support what we're doing through Patreon. So my deepest heartfelt thanks to all of you. One small way to show my appreciation is to read your name uh, at the end of an episode each month. So with my deepest gratitude, I would like to thank our founder patrons. Those are Esmeralda, Abigail, SJ, Cadaver Kelly, Junkyard Bat, Samantha, and Samantha Dietz. Thank you all so, so much. At the Nocturnal Council level, I'd like to thank Christine, Nephilim Incorruptus, Skullgirdle, Natalie, DJ Azzy, Mike Mess, Dawn, Fifth Dream, Amy, I Am Ruin, Sav, Jacob, Michelle, Jen, Sebastian, Hayshaker, Moses, Felina, and Top Down Tom. Thank you all so, so much. And finally, at the Crow's Call level, Isabel, Dom, Angel, Alex Kennedy, Anne, Heather, Marissa, Becca, David, Alex, Kelly, Dagger Dance, Caroline Carnivorous, Alana, Irene, Susan, Kay, Mark, King Rhinex, Jonathan, Wolfie, Jason, David, Morgan, Kevin, Eduardo, Jan, Richard, Gandalis, Isabel, Elizabeth, Jennifer, Kevin, Bruce, Enya, Keen, Anna, Death Metal Kumbaya, Laurel, Ava, Stuart, Nia, Martin, Dry Is She, Gateway Goth Events, Morgan, GPS, Two Broke Goths, Eternal Winter, Megan, Nick, Esther, Paul, Laura, Rebecca, Leah, Captain Faust, Ryan, Master Squirrel, and Stolas. Thank you all so much. Hey, good morning. What are you saying? I'm saying thank you to all the people that support us. Okay, well, can I get my breakfast into the morning too? I can get your breakfast. Do you want to say thank you too? Yes. <laughs> Am I a podcaster? No. <laughs> okay, good point. You want to sit with me for a second while I finish this? Mm. So next month we're going to be back 
<laughs> oh, Satan willing with two episodes. And the one we should be returning with is going to be uh, the one I teased during this episode. Essentially a baby bat, new goth, goth moth, whatever you want to call it, 101. We're going to be bringing on three guests. I won't say who they are, just in case. Uh, but there should be a whole range of age groups represented. And we're going to go every over everything from fashion to music to getting into the club scene to making friends to make up all the kind of bases and topics that uh, you might be interested in if you're just starting out getting into the subculture. And we're going to have a whole diverse array of perspectives on that. So I think that's going to be an interesting episode. If you would like to support us on Patreon, head over to patreon.com slash cemetery confessions. But that's going to do it for us. So until next time. Stay dark. You want to say bye? Bye. The preceding program is a member of The Belfry, a network of blogs, podcasts, and videos for the darkly inclined. Go to thebelfry.rip for more information.